My name is Sharon Durkin, Boston City Councilor for District 8, and I'm the chair of Boston City Council's Committee on Boston COVID-19 Recovery. Today is September 4th, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Files Channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.covid19 at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. Individuals will be called on in the order of which they're signed up and will have two minutes to testify. If you are interested in testifying in person, please add your name to the sign-up sheet near the entrance of the chamber. If you are looking to testify virtually, please email our central staff liaison, Karishma, um, her email is k-a-r-i-s-h-m-a dot c-h-o-u-h-a-n at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on a, a docket 0473, order for a hearing regarding review of COVID-19 recovery funds. This matter was sponsored by um, me, uh, Councilor Orell, and Councilor Tanya Fernandez-Anderson and referred to the committee on March 6, 2024. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues in order of arrival, um, Council President Lucy Louisian, um, and my Vice Chair, um, Councillor Ed Flynn. Um, I'll just, um, I, I think what I'm going to do is I'll give my openings, or I'll give my opening statement with questions. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go uh, to the panel uh, for opening statements um, and really brief opening statements, and then we are going to go to the presentation, um, and then I'll let my colleagues both give an opening statement and ask their questions at the same time. Um, and as with all my hearings um, in my other committee as well, we'll be ending this meeting promptly at 5 p.m. So um, I hope that, and I did want to um, acknowledge that one member of our panel, um, Deputy Director Wright, has a prior commitment and has to leave at three. Um, so he will give his statement first. Um, and if you have any questions for him, you can ask those first. Um, we've been joined um, by panelists Ashley Groffenberger, uh, Chief Financial Officer, Sheila Dillon, Chief of Housing. Um, uh, we've been joined by Kara, Kara Elliott Ortega, Director of Arts and Culture, sorry, Chief of Arts and Culture. Uh, Vineet Gupta, Director of Planning Pol Policy for the Streets Cabinet, um, and Donald Wright, Deputy Director of OEOI. Um, in the chamber, uh, we are joined by Rick Wilson, a Director of Admin and Finance, Mayor's Office of Housing, Joel Wool, Deputy Administrator of Sustainability and Capital <coughs> Transformation at the BHA, Omar um, Koshafa, uh, Finance and Permits for the Streets Cabinet, um, and the th latter three will be available to answer any questions, um, but will not be testifying on the panel today. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over um, to um, well, first I'll turn it over just a matter of introductions to um, Chief Financial Officer Ashley Groffensberger. Uh, thanks, Chair, uh, Councillors. Thanks for having us here today. Um, I think in the interest of time, we maybe we'll forego our opening statements and just do a quick introductions and then can turn it over to you or get right into our presentation, whatever, however you want to structure it. So um, I'm Ashley Groffenberger. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the City of Boston. And I'm joined by my colleagues, and I'll allow them to just quickly introduce themselves. Sure. Um, happy to be here. Sheila Dillon, Chief of Housing for the City of Boston and Director of the Mayor's Office of Housing. Hi, Cara Elliott Ortega, Chief of Arts and Culture. Uh, Vineet Gupta, I'm the Director of Policy and Planning for the Streets Cabinet. And good afternoon, Donald Wright, Deputy Chief, Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. Uh, Chair, do you want us to get right into the presentation? Yeah, that okay. would be great. And then um, my colleagues will um, get into questions. Awesome. But if we can keep this part as brief as possible, because I know some of my colleagues do want to, um, or not, not as brief as possible, you know, but just move it along. That'd sure. Be great. Okay, we'll be, we'll be um, efficient. So um, thanks again so much for having this hearing. We're, we're happy to be here today. Um, we're really here to provide you all with an um, overview and an update 
on this really once in a generation award um, uh, to the city of Boston through the American Rescue Plan, or ARPA, as you will hear us refer to it going forward. Um, we'll provide an overview of the award, um, some of the spending to date, and some of the future plans for the um, award money um, as we move through the next two years. Uh, okay. Let's see. So just by way of providing a quick overview, um, the city received um, an award of $558.7 million total in ARPA funds. Um, to date, the city and the city council have allocated or appropriated um, a majority of that, $551.7 million across um, eight orders. Um, over the uh, 2021 and 2022. Um, of that 551, um, 18 City of Boston departments received ARPA funding. We have um, funded a total of 119 projects. And um, if you're doing the subtraction, we have $7 million left over that has not been appropriated. Um, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. So just to... Um, Reminder of the eight orders that were um, appropriated through City Council to appropriate that 551. Um, it was spread over um, a number of orders that are sort of summarized here, the largest one being in July 2022 um, of just 362.2 million for a variety of transformative investments. And again, um, 7 million is yet to be appropriated and will be brought before the Council in a forthcoming order. Um, this is a just quick summary of how that 551.7 in the authorized ARPA funds breaks down into some major categories. Um, as you can see, a majority of the funding um, is allocated towards um, housing programs and expenditures. Um, the city also allocated about um, 95 million um, in what was known as revenue replacement um, and allowed us to preserve core city services as we were coming out of the pandemic. Um, there were also major investments in economic opportunity inclusion, climate and mobility, um, the pandemic response itself, um, mental health, arts and culture, early childhood, and um, the evaluation and administration of the program. Um, this table breaks down um, the spending to date as of June 30th, 2024, which is our last public reporting um, period to the U.S. Treasury, who kind of oversees um, these funds, and is reflected on um, the public dashboard that we maintain uh, to help track these funds for the public. Um, so to kind of quickly walk you through this table, um, as of June 30th, 2024, we have spent 323.8 million, um, so well over, well on our way um, uh, to spending down that 551 uh, that we have allocated. Um, we have uh, 82.2 million dollars in funds that are obligated, and now obligated means that they are encumbered and are, you know, set aside or earmarked for a particular purpose, and have been, you know, for the pur for the purchase of goods or services, but have just yet to kind of go out the door, but they are obligated in the eyes of the federal government. We will, you know, meet our obligation to expend those funds. Um, we just haven't gotten it out the door quite yet. Um, and then this third number here on the table, funds to be obligated, this 145.7. Um, so that is the, um, the balance of funds that we have yet to kind of obligate or kind of encumber or spend. Um, but I'm joined by my colleagues here today who, you know, across the four of their um, cabinets and departments represent a majority of that 145. So I think what we're really trying to um, make clear today is that the city has plans for that 145 and, the, and the, um, my colleagues here today will talk about exactly how we will obligate and spend those funds in, in time for the deadline. And just as a quick reminder for folks on dates, um, by December 30th, 2024, we have to have all of our funds obligated. So all of that 558.7 um, will need to be obligated by the end of this calendar year. And then all of the money will need to be spent by December 30th, 31st, 2026. So we have two years after that obligation date to fully expend. Um, 
So this just further breaks down that 145.7 um, of funds that are to be obligated. Um, and again, my colleagues are going to spend some time today talking through um, kind of the plans and expectations for how we're going to obligate and spend those funds. Um, as you can see from the stack bar here, um, a majority of the funds um, are obligate or are for housing projects, as well as EOI, um, economic opportunity and inclusion projects, climate no mobility, and arts and culture. So I think that ends my portion of this presentation. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues to explain some of the key expenditures and successes to date, as well as the plans for that 145 we just talked about. Oh, I think, Donna, let's turn it over to you first, since you have a hard stop. So we just got to go through to the end. Good afternoon, Councilors. Uh, Donald Wright, Deputy Chief. I mentioned that earlier. I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, Chief Eddie will unfortunately couldn't be here today, so I'm filling in for him, as well as Sarah Duluth, who's out on medical leave, and she actually administers all of our ARPA programs. She's our Director of Operations. So I'm going to run you through some of our key highlights of, of what we've done. But since uh, 22, uh, roughly $44 million has been obligated or spent to advance transformative initiatives to support small business, sustainability, establish equitable tourism, and advance supply diversity goals. Some of these highlights include uh, 13 million uh, spent on small business relief fund. I just want to thank all, all of you for your support in those efforts as well. Nine million supporting pandemic affected community enterprises through our space program. Um, Eight million in supply capital, supplying capital and leveraging education through our scale program. Next slide, please. Some additional uh, key updates are we spent $4.7 million for a commercial rental relief fund, uh, $3.2 uh, million in uh, Reimagine Boston through our Main Streets program, $1.7 million in our all-inclusive program, $1 million in High Roads Kitchen Restaurant Revitalization Fund, um, and $1 million for Refresh, um, which is our small business grants. And I just want to thank you all again for helping us disseminate and get that information out to your constituencies. Um, just a few more here, 450000 for small business support, um, 350 k an immigrant uh, business support. Council Mejia, just giving you some shouts on that one. Thank you very much for your work on that. Uh, 350 k uh, for our Office of Nightlife, uh, Life, <coughs> Nightlife Economy uh, support. Um, and our look ahead in this case, um, we looked at uh, for $1.5 million remaining to expend through uh, has been obligated for uh, uh, specific purposes, including supporting revolving loan fund, um, supporting creation of an updated economic development study uh, to support the arts corridor, uh, as well as to support additional technical assistance for small businesses. And that concludes our section. Thank you, Donald. Um, and it's, it's good to be here with all of you today and talk about uh, what the Mayor's Office of Housing and the Boston Housing Authority have been able to accomplish with this very welcome large infusion of resource. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, you may recall that when we first came to you, let me just, we um, had broken down our efforts, our housing efforts, into certain categories. Uh, we are focused with, with a lot of input from constituents and yourselves, home, increasing home ownership in the city, building more supportive housing for our most vulnerable, uh, taking units out of the speculative market through our acquisition opportunity program, uh, really supporting the renovation and greening of public housing, and jump-starting large site development. Uh, as of today, we have uh, in, uh, spent $147 million. They've been obligated or spent on all of these transformative initiatives. First time home buying assistance, we have uh, assisted just shy of 200 new first time home buyers. Uh, 48 of those are Boston Housing Authority residents, which um, just love this program working closely with the BHA. 
77% of our new home buyers are BIPOC, and 33% have purchased in the neighborhoods of Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan. We're also building more opportunities, uh, home ownership opportunities that folks can afford. We have committed $16 million uh, to create 108 units, and these, are, um, these developments are all local MWBE or BIPOC-led development teams. Um, we have focused uh, in, to increase our supportive housing. Uh, we, we know that to reduce our shelter populations and to house folks that are living on the street, we need to build more supportive housing. We have committed just shy of $17 million to create 217 units of permanent housing. Uh, the picture there is LaGrange, which hopefully will break ground in, in the next couple of weeks downtown. And uh, a program that we all feel very good about, uh, we have committed $35.7 million to acquire and convert market rate housing that, that is tenanted. And we have taken 326 units out of the speculative market, and we've done this across Boston, Brighton, Chinatown, Dorchester, East Boston, Fenway, Hyde Park, Mattapan, and Roxbury. So this program is having wide neighborhood reach. The Boston Housing Authority has been very, very hard at work, um, really working to improve the lives of our public housing residents. They are currently out to bid on dozens and dozens of projects, and the improvements will include energy efficient windows, ventilation to improve air quality, and so much more. As you also know, we have uh, Grow Boston within the Mayor's Office of Housing, and they have been spending their ARPA money to increase the amount of raised garden beds for low-income gardeners throughout the city, and we have spent $138,000 on that effort. And we have, we're very, very happy to invest $183,000 to create a rooftop farm at Boston Medical Center. Moving forward, uh, we know that we have got money to obligate and we feel very good about where we are because we've identified projects for that resource. Uh, we have uh, identified at least one, possibly more, permanent supportive housing projects and one affordable senior housing project. We have three applications for more acquisition funding through the AOP program and we have, uh, are going to obligate six additional home ownership projects that we have identified that will create 70 units, uh, and all of this will be committed by October. We continue to focus on the large sites, um, and many of you have been involved in these conversations. Three large sites have been designated for mixed-use development and will be committed by October or November of this year. Um, it was a very fast turnaround to get the resources, have a community process, and get through Article 80, and I really want to thank you all for, for folks that have helped with, with, those, with the neighborhood dialogue. When completed, these projects will include hundreds and hundreds of affordable housing units, but our job is to commit funding for these first phases in these developments. And healthy and green housing, we have got a lot of effort taking place uh, in this area right now. Seven large multifamily housing projects, 300 affordable housing units have been awarded funding to undergo deep energy retrofits for energy efficiency, climate resilience, and will be committed this September. And we have 104 buildings identified, and we have provided resources and that, that total 2,300 units, and they have been approved for energy assessments, making them ready uh, for when a lot of the federal green money make, becomes available and state money, they will have assessments done and they will know what they need to apply for. And that is it. And I, I do want to recognize Rick Wilson, who has been in our, our team, who has been really keeping all of these ARPA projects um, moving forward. We meet every week. Uh, we have very, very important meetings every week where we're tracking every detail to make sure our money is spent. So Rick is here if you have any very detailed questions. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I'm Vineet Gupta. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning at the Streets Cabinet. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with the City Council on uh, our use of ARPA funds. We, uh, we have several new programs that we have started through this, through this resource. 
uh, the fare free bus pilot, which is essentially uh, free rides on the 23, 28, and 29 routes in Mattapan, Roxbury, and Dorchester. Uh, as a result of this program, we've seen ridership increase on these routes faster than ridership has increased on other routes in the MBTA system since the pandemic. So we've, we've allocated, we have obligated eight million for that program to date. We've also launched a Safe Routes to School initiative. This has been focused in the Garrison Trotter neighborhood in Roxbury. And in this particular phase, working hand in hand with the Boston Public Schools, uh, we are doing small scale improvements at several locations, uh, including the Higgins Lewis. In addition, we have just launched a e-bike incentive program, and this allows us to, uh, it's an applications-based process. We, in the first phase, received uh, approximately 1,200 applications. We will be giving vouchers for over a two-year period of about 1,000 vouchers. Uh, the eligibility for these is uh, old uh, seniors, uh, adults with disabilities, and uh, low-income residents. Our uh, traffic safety program continues in addition to uh, monies that we are already spending through other sources. We are using two million for traffic calming for our neighborhood slow streets program, though that has not trans uh, transitioned into our safety search program. Uh, another smaller project is uh, we are working with uh, the Mission Hill neighborhood. They have a shuttle that uh, runs in the neighborhood, and it's been running there since the 70s, and they were looking for uh, kind of uh, some, they want to buy some new equipment and keep that shuttle system running. So we did a study with them and they're going to continue that service with a new bus. That is a summary of what we have obligated so far. Uh, and the next slide, very briefly, I can walk over what we're expecting to obligate in the next year or in the coming months, really, given that we have to finish obligation by the end of this year. We intend to continue, or not intend, but we will be continuing the free bus pilot for those three routes that I mentioned uh, with an approximately uh, the same amount of money that will keep us going for uh, two years, the eight million, uh, up to 20, 2026. Uh, the Safe Routes to School program will expand from outside of its current Garrison Trotter neighborhood area. We are launching a new program that we are doing hand in hand with the planning department squares and streets initiative but we'll be looking at rosendale square and maverick square uh, in rosendale and east boston respectively uh, to do safety improvements and uh, see if, if we can accommodate people on bikes but the focus is really going to be on uh, helping small businesses uh, thrive in those two uh, neighborhoods or really small uh, Main Street districts. In addition, we are going to, in the coming uh, year, uh, look more closely at our bike network and uh, relaunch our engagement with, with the neighborhoods in the city uh, to uh, find uh, what preferences they would like to see in their communities. The e-bike incentive program will continue as well. And uh, we are, uh, we have identified a site at Frontage Road to, uh, which would become a centralized a, a location for our recycled materials. That's a quick summary of uh, what the streets cabinet is looking at. I should have mentioned at the start that uh, Chief Yasha Franklin Hodge is on vacation. So I'm here on his behalf. Thank you. You're more than qualified to be here on his behalf. So thank you so much, Vineet. Um, and then I now we'll go to the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Hi, thank you all. Um, and just as a, a reminder, stepping back to when we were first discussing this funding, um, our hope with the ARPA funds was to address both the impact of COVID on the creative sector, artists and arts organizations, and creative businesses, 
um, and also so provide more support for arts access um, around the city, especially um, using public spaces and especially in communities most impacted by COVID-19 because we know that arts access helps connect communities and connect people and um, create healthier communities as well. So um, we have uh, funded in a few different areas with these funds. Um, the first is creative activations. So 3.7 million has been invested in events and cultural activations around the city, mainly through a new program um, called the Neighborhood and Downtown Activation Grant. These are free and open to the public events, such as cultural festivals, um, family arts programs, a lot of arts and health um, that we've all done through grants. Um, I will say this is uh, something that I don't think the city has funded before in this way, and we saw just like an amazing outpouring from across the city of people wanting to do things. We've received over $20 million in requests for support to do these kinds of activities. Um, this is letting us do some big citywide events that will bring people into downtown, um, like the Illuminous Festival, uh, major new initiatives for Boston um, through multi-year support, like the Boston Public Art Triennial, and then to date, um, another 65 or so activations around the city. Um, and we're in our fourth and final round of that grant making, which closes, uh, application is open now and closes September 23rd. Uh, we've invested $1 million in City Hall Plaza programs. Um, last summer, this included uh, 25 activations, um, 10,000 or so program participants, um, creating a lot of job opportunities for local artists and arts workers. Um, and we're in the middle of our second year of that now um, with the Fiesta on the Plaza um, starting later this month to celebrate Latinx Heritage Month. Um, we have uh, in contract um, $1.65 million to activate the art corridor in District 7. Um, and that includes murals, um, working with local businesses on um, kind of beautification projects, um, block party uh, festivals, and other kinds of activations on the corridor. Um, a half a million dollars supporting our citywide mural program. Um, this is our largest um, uh, WMBE contract, um, and this is supporting um, uh, the execution of all of these murals around the city and increasing our ability to, to do those. So we have um, 12 murals right now that are being painted or have just been painted in nine different BPS schools. So we were really excited to do that and have a big push um, to get those all done this year. Uh, and we'll have another um, year of similar programming next year. Um, we have also been uh, focused on increasing cultural access, as I mentioned. Um, two main programs we've been supporting there. Uh, the first is BPS Sundays, which provides free access to BPS youth and families at six of our major institutions, and we just extended that through the calendar year. Uh, and a $2 million kind of pilot program in partnership with BCYF to bring um, arts and culture providers into centers around the city and look at what it really takes to support um, kind of high quality cultural access um, in these neighborhoods. Um, and then lastly, uh, we worked on a um, really innovative grant program to support arts and culture organizations. Um, this distributed and will distribute um, $7.3 million over three and a half years to organizations that were also selected in partnership with community members. So we had a, a community advisory team actually looking at all of these materials and really ensuring that these um, investments were being made in organizations that um, really are, you know, by and for the communities that they're serving. And that's supporting a variety of organizational needs that help those organizations actually be sustainable in Boston and um, kind of be the cultural institutions that we want to have here for the next 10 years and more. And then lastly, um, in terms of what we have left to spend, um, we have several RFPs that are going out um, next week. One is for multi-year contracts for technical assistance and professional development for creative workers, um, who I know, um, I know that many of you know how hard hit um, creative workers of different types were during the pandemic and still kind of creating their business models and coming back. Um, so this will help with things that we know people always need um, around business development. And then um, the remaining 2.65 million is going towards the redevelopment of 290 North Beacon. This is a, um, a development mitigation that came to the city in the form of a building in Alston Brighton. Um, and this was the result of uh, a project that displaced hundreds of musicians in the neighborhood. Um, and we now have this property that we will be working with uh, the BHA on to develop affordable cultural space to uh, reprovide that space that was lost to the music community, um, as well as uh, public housing. 
And then everything that's remaining um, is scheduled to be spent on research and evaluation and communications. So even though this is one-time funding, we'd really like to learn about the impact of this. It's always challenging to tell the story of the impact of arts funds, and we want to make sure that we're doing that in a really detailed way, um, evaluating these programs and hopefully making the, the case to sustain funding for some of these new ideas. Thank you so much. Um, Chief Grafensberger, was there anything else to the presentation? Just a quick wrap up. So I know that was a, a rapid fire summary of half a billion dollars. So um, I, we welcome your questions, but um, you know, just really wanted to take the opportunity to explain what we've done to date and really the plans we have for going forward and how we're going to kind of land this plain um, in, the, in the end of two years. And, and also just want to thank you all for your partnership throughout this and um, going forward as we spend this once in a generation um, pot of money. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. Um, it sounds like with this once in a lifetime money for small businesses, we've had the opportunity to make businesses more possible, main streets more vibrant and beautiful on housing. Uh, we've made our housing stock more green, resilient, we've made home ownership more attainable and accessible, and we've supported the most vulnerable and those facing displacement. On transportation, we've made safer pedestrian routes, um, more affordable, safe, and even free transportation options. And a special shout out to the Mission Hill Link. Um, but now comes the hard part. We need to do everything we can to spend every single dollar of federal dollars and, and make sure that they're obligated before the end of the year. Um, it's not only the city's fiduciary duty, it's the city council's fiduciary duty to be a part of that. And um, I do want to set the table here as the COVID-19 recovery committee chair. Um, I know so much work, even prior to me being on the city council, has gone on. Um, in this, um, but I think it's for us and this current city council and, and my colleagues that are here to, again, be part of landing that ship. Um, and I think the administration um, and the chiefs here and those that are were unable to attend to um, have done a great job of um, setting the city's priorities and also uh, COVID-19 set <clears throat> those priorities. Like the COVID-19 um, recovery money was for a specific purpose, which was getting us out of that pandemic. And even being the chair of COVID-19 now seems a little strange, but um, years ago, um, years ago, we would have not been in this room together. We would have been in a very different place. And I think the administration's leadership in that moment um, and these dollars that have already been obligated and spent um, have done, um, uh, have had a role in, in why we're sitting in a very different Boston today. So I want to thank the mayor and her administration for showing up to this hearing. This will not be the last hearing. Um, and I think my first question uh, when it comes to uh, this money and where we're headed with it is when is the next federal filing deadline? And um, obviously on my end as the COVID-19 recovery chair, we will be hosting another hearing. So what I'm looking for um, from um, this hearing um, today is for us not to use this hearing on our wish list and how we'd like potentially this last $7 million to be spent. What I'd like to do is focus our efforts on um, both asking questions about the money that has been spent asking money about the money that has been obligated and also asking money about um, about that last uh, 145.7 million dollars um, and what these because we've got a stacked room of people who are working on this at the city um, any nitty-gritty questions specifically about the money that is to be obligated um, and then in order to set the table, um, Chief Gravensberger just wanted to ask when the next federal de deadline um, for filing would be and whether this $145.7 million um, will be completely obligated through that federal um, uh, document. Um, thanks for the question. So I believe we report on a quarterly basis. So we are approaching that September 30th um, reporting date. Um, so, as we said, this is uh, the, the numbers that we showed you today are spending um, and obligations through June 30th, which, which is our most recent report. Um, 
as I think some of my colleagues here mentioned, um, since that reporting date, some money has actually already gone out the door or will go out the door this week. So we will see some um, movement in those numbers as, as at our next um, quarterly reporting deadline. Um, but just again, to remind everyone in the room, we have to obligate all of that by December 30th. So um, time is ticking, uh, but we feel very confident that we have a plan and um, was discussed earlier to obligate all of those 145 minus whatever went out the door this week um, by the December 30th deadline, 31st. And, and just also to set the table, um, what, how can you describe the mechanism for obligating the funds and how much detail the city needs to provide um, on, on exactly what the money is being allocated for? Sure, so uh, the way we demonstrate that money has been obligated is that we either have um, a contract in place or a purchase order in place. So we're either buying a service or a particular good um, with that funding. So if we can provide that that money has been kind of you know encumbered through those two mechanisms, the federal government allows us to count that as obligated. And I have a lot of trust um, because of the money that's already been obligated and spent that the city can do this, but what we're also um, up against is a deadline, and what we've seen from the last six months is not a ton of movement um, on just the amount of money that's been obligated in like the last six months. So I know that you've described the plans um, in each individual department, but I just, I think as the chair of this committee, it's really important to um, to say that like this should be at the top of every single person's list and um, I think um, summer's over um, like we have a lot of work to be done and um, and it's I absolutely believe it's possible and I absolutely think we have the right team at the city in place to do it um, but I, I do think it's we're at a place where like and I think everyone knows that but as the city council chair on this committee. Um, I also have a fiduciary responsibility to the city to um, make sure that we don't waste a single federal dollar that can be spent. And at Chief, I know you have that same obligation. So, um, so I'm gonna open this up to my colleagues for questions. Um, I did wanna just flag um, again, um, uh, Deputy uh, Chief Glover needs to leave by, oh. Right. right, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, you're not Donald Glover. Sorry, <laughs> that's a bad one. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, Deputy Director Wright uh, needs to leave. This is the problem. I don't have it right in front of me. Um, needs to leave by three. So, if you have any questions for him specifically, make sure that you ask those first. Um, so, we're going to start with a um, four minutes uh, with each, and these are my colleagues in order of arrival. Um, Council President Louis Jean. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And you kind of look like Donald Glover, could be his cousin. So <laughs> I want to thank everyone in the administration for being here. Um, I'm really just happy. Like this, I'm getting like, I, I just get goosebumps just hearing about the work that this council did alongside the administration for these transformative investments. And I really think that like, so many of us here who were here when we were deciding about how we invest these dollars, uh, when we're talking about digital equity, if we're talking about home ownership, if we're talking about housing for vulnerable populations, migrants, new arrivals, uh, folks returning home from incarceration, there's some really great work that we were able to do, this transformative investment. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to participate in that work and that we're gonna continue, uh, whether it's the refresh grants or whether it's um, the space grants, I think there's been, we've opened the door for a lot of people who've had the door close on them. Or if it's work that I know Councillor Coletta Zapata, birthday girl, um, did happy birthday on the Blue Line portfolio, showing that a new model is possible to really stem against the tide of, of, of speculation in our community. So just want to say that I think that this was a very special moment in partnership and collaboration of working together um, to, number one, fight the housing issues that we have in the city and the arts work that Chief, you were talking about. It's, it's all been really impactful um, from residents and community members I've talked to. So we feel pretty confident that by the end of this year, we will have obligated $145 million. Like we will meet that deadline. Um, are we on track 
to are there any large scale projects that we have that we think face any challenges of being fully spent by the 2026 deadline? Yeah, I think this may be a, more of a Chief Dillon question. So um, thank you for the question. It's a really, it, you know, it's one that we um, wrestle with every single day. Um, we are tracking, we have got money against everything that we have an obligated, we have a, a project or a program against. And so we watch that progress every single day. We also have in our back pocket plan B, right? Just in the, in, just in the case that a developer runs into an unexpected environmental issue or has a lawsuit, which we've seen happen now, now and again. So we have a substitute project where we would swap, same category, but swap and then hold the money back for the original project in the event that it takes a little bit longer. But we only have a few of those. The vast majority we feel very, very good about obligating with enough information by year end, but we do have a few that we're watching carefully. Okay, there are some, um, so I know that there have been some partial spends and some money that have been uh, allocated for certain projects, but there are some where like no money has been spent yet. Um, one of them is transforming publicly owned land into green mixed income communities. Yeah. And by I mean spent, I mean it hasn't even been obligated, like no money from that $29 million, mm -hmm. $30 million. Yeah. What, I think you spoke to that a little bit, but why was that one so difficult and are we mm -hmm. on track to get that fully mm -hmm. obligated given that we haven't touched it at yeah. all? I'll start and then if Rick, if you have anything to add because you've been tracking these. So there's, there were three or four, pro, three large sites that we were really looking at. Austin Street in Charlestown, 12C in Charlestown, Chinatown, and the water and sewer lots uh, in Lower Roxbury. And so, you know, they, it was very ambitious because, you know, it was a short timetable and also lots of community conversation if we're developing these very large lots that have hundreds and hundreds of, of units. So um, the community process has taken not longer than we anticipated, but you know a decent amount of time. And now we're heading into what we, you know, some of our first projects that we wanted to fund. They're running into some fairly high, stiff infrastructure and housing costs or construction costs. So we still feel pretty good about these projects. Um, Austin Street has a little some infrastructure issues that we may need to swap and then, like I talked about, swap and then hold back money for that at a slightly later date. But we do have plan B in case we need to do that. I don't know if... Rick, if you have anything you want to add? Up to you. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Matt? Oh, do you want to... Yeah, do you want to keep going? Because I know you're trying to... No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. No, come on. Come on. Um. <laughs> I was just going to add, all, all three sites have been, they all, all, three, all three sites have been designated and they have been awarded, so they are far along, and like Sheila said, we're um, talking every week, if not every other day, about these projects and tracking their progress, and um, we, do have, we do have backup projects, so I feel, I feel confident overall well, with all of our, we're down to 82 million now, I think, that we need to obligate by the end of the year, and I feel confident about our ability to do that. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll save my, I believe I'm out of uh, time, I'll save. My, my questions for later. My big question is like once money is has been um, has been obligated, we obligate everything by 2024. Things change between 24, 24 and 2026. 20, is there a leeway to sort of move that around? But that's that's the other really big question that I care about. Do you want to answer that, Chief Robbins? Um, I I want to get the answer for you, and then I will. Per I want to make sure I have the correct answer so we can. Okay. Yeah. But Perfect. No, noted the question. Um, and I'm so sorry I got your name wrong earlier, but um, but we've we've drawn attention to the fact that he needs to leave. So if anyone has a question for small business, um, and I, I just want to give a chance for him to answer those questions since he needs to leave. And I'm sorry, we'll go in the order of arrival otherwise. But um, okay, seeing none. Um, I do. I live. Yeah, so, so we'll go in the order of arrival in terms of questions. So uh, my vice chair, Councillor Flynn, you're first. But please put your light on if you have a um, question about small business. Thank you, Madam Chair. Donald, good to see you. Thanks for the work you've done for so many years. Donald, any, um, I know we always talk about support we provide for veterans and military families. What can you tell us about what your team did over the um, last several years supporting veterans and military families? Uh, 
we've done quite a bit, and I, it, it sort of overlaps between a couple of departments. But I, I could you I'm put sure. the mic closer? <laughs> Thank you. But uh, most recently, um, there's been some outreach to our veteran community, um, and really trying to find a, a pathway to doing more uh, with those veterans, trying to identify those that that are owners of small businesses, maybe a potential contract or maybe able to provide a service or something like that to, uh, to, uh, to the city. So what we've done is we've met, um, had some very early on uh, meetings with them, and I think that that will continue uh, to happen over the next fiscal year, but done some, some I, what I think really good work. But I can find some detail um, around specific uh, types of programs. Thank you, Donald. I always enjoyed working with you. Um, so, Madam Chair, do I continue with my questioning or? No, what I was going to do is just let everyone ask their questions of him and then okay. and let him go. But I, I'll take this away from your time, your, your next round. Okay, um, Councillor Coletta Zapata. It's just in the order of arrival if you have a question for the. Okay, thank you so much, Chair. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for the work that we've done together on food carts. Yes. Really excited about that. It's so up and running. Yes. We're going to push that out uh, sooner rather than later. Great. I do have a question about, and sorry, I have multiple tabs open. Sure. So the, um, there's 1.5 million remaining to expend for, the, there's a couple of qualifiers. So to support the creation of an updated economic development study and then two, to support additional technical assistance for small business. So my, my question is two parts. Um, for the support for, or the additional technical assistance for small business, is any of that going to the pilot program for food carts that, that we created? Um, do you have a dollar amount for that? And then I'll, I'll stop there. Get back to you on that one. Okay, you, you'll get back to us with that information? So uh, what we're looking at is, is trying to support um, the technical assistance side would be sort of typical of what we already support, you know, like the, the, the food truck industry, non-motorized folks. So anything beyond that, we're going to have to look at when we transition from a pilot to a, a, a standalone program, take back what we've got from the reporting of meeting with some of these folks to find out what additional needs they have. I know that the small business team has been doing quite a bit of work of, of over the last couple of years just researching uh, this non-motorized uh, uh, industry and finding out where the pain points are. And so what we're trying to do is align our work with that. We talked with you about the, the, the waiving of fees, if, if that's an issue. Well, based on the research, that wasn't the bottleneck. It may have been the overall system or when someone sees that a site might be challenging to navigate. So how do we go about addressing that? So we're looking at um, you know, the entire ecosystem and finding out from those, those uh, vendors really what needs they have. Okay, Thank you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Fitzgerald? I have one more question. Sorry, you're actually, I, I was doing, um, you've, okay, go ahead. Oh, oh, okay, I thought we went through the timing. Thank you, and it, it'll be quick. So the- um, So he's got six minutes left and there's two more questions, so I just wanted to. Okay, I'll see you in time. I'll, I'll get you yeah. offline. Um, Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Donald. Very quickly, um, uh, the 1.6 million remaining that's in the Main Street's beautification, uh, is, that, is that obligated in any way to anything? Or is that, I mean, now that it's obligated, been obligated to the beautification, um, but is there still, it's unclaimed otherwise in terms of what Main Streets can apply for that 1.6 million remaining? Uh, that's fine. These are just we can all get back to me. Yeah, let me I'll that. just fire. Because I just, I just want to be clear on just where those funds exactly go to. Yep. Street, so. And uh, is the, in the commercial rent relief fund. Yep. Is it? Uh, is there a breakdown of um, what uh, businesses in District Three may have that? And I'm sure probably all of our other councils would can like get a you breakdown. That. Yeah. yeah, I haven't yeah. seen that. Thank right. you. And then the, um, the the small business. I believe it was the grant program, the um, refresh grant program. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Rick and uh, Chilo will remember, would, is, does this supplement, because I know there was a, when I worked in economic development, there's the CDBG program of, uh, that was loans, the revolving loan fund. These are grants, are those, they're not in no way, they're not the same, right? These are separate things, but um, can the businesses still apply for both a loan and a grant if needed?
Okay, I think what I'll do is. Um, so these, those are my questions. I got yeah. the questions. That's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, counselor. Guys. I think what I'll do is I'll um, ask those questions um, via email. Um, yep. So, uh, Councillor Breda and then Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here today. These are, it's really an incredible amount of money that we've been able to have access to do, to do some really great things for the city. Um, uh, I, th I think the question I had was really with regard, to, in regard to economic uh, opportunity and inclusion, thinking about um, the, the vapour, like the, the effects of COVID are still very much with us, and we are seeing small businesses in our neighbourhoods who are seeing an incredible increase in their rents, like they, they maybe were, they struggled through COVID and then all of a sudden uh, there is incredible pressure from landlords to jack up the rents at an extortionate rate. I would call it extortion. Like for, we visited a business last week, 40% increase in their, in their rent uh, this year. Um, and then also the food delivery costs. I, I think um, what sort of strategies do we have to try and protect our uh, small businesses, our immigrant-owned, women-owned, mom-and-pop businesses in, in our main streets and uh, try and just keep them afloat? Uh, because I'm very, very concerned about displacement. Well, it, it starts really with that. It's the, the initial engagement. And so the relationships that we have with our Main Street districts and our neighborhood business managers are going to be that direct conduit to those businesses. And so we'll hear firsthand, not three or four months down the line, but we're hoping that through that relationship and our neighborhood business managers being in the community, we'll find out very early on when the business is struggling um, and, and at least try to identify a pathway. Um, if there's you know, some aspect of, of displacement, if we find out early enough we can attempt to uh, to try and find some resolution on that. And, and do we have the capacity to offer sort of legal legal support for uh, small businesses, like uh, just like a, yeah. our housing stabilisation? We you have do. advice for folks who've been yes, tenants being displaced, but commercial tenants, small commercial tenants, mm -hmm. what have we got an offer for those folks? And so it's we still do have, we, we do have technical assistance that will support those folks in that way. Okay, I just want to make sure I give a chance to for everyone to ask you a question. Um, so, um, Councillor Mejia and then Councillor Rural. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rural and then Councillor Mejia. Sorry, I was doing it in the order of, okay, go ahead. What, uh, what was I here before you? You were here before me. I was here before you. That's why you go next. All right. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Mejia, and thank you to the administration for all your work on um, ARPA dollars. Uh, Deputy Wright, always great seeing you. Uh, pleasure working with you. Um, as you know, uh, we have liquor licenses uh, coming to the city of Boston um, in the amount of 225. Um, as we know, on the private market, the liquor licenses cost around $600,000. Uh, so if you um, were to do a evaluation on that cost of liquor licenses or the investment um, over the next three years, that's um, $135 million, right, if it was on the private market that's coming into these areas. Um, knowing that some of the ARPA dollars or our tax dollars can't be used uh, for our businesses to make sure that they have the education and the support um, to, um, you know, whether it's technical assistance or helping them with funding to renovate or build out a space, um, are we, do we have a program um, that's going to support uh, these new restaurateurs um, that are, you know, going to be receiving these liquor licenses that are also in these zip codes that have been, you know, disproportionately impacted by COVID. So something like our, our restore program, something to that effect. Is right. Different. Right. So we, we will look at resources that that we may have uh, in that case, beautification, things of that nature. Um, but specifically, I'm going to get questioning. Okay, yeah, and, and if we can, you know, just because this is a major investment that's coming into the areas that were, you know, disproportionately impacted by COVID, um, if we can, if possible, try to create a program and use some of these funds. I just want to be clear um, that, like, this isn't, um, I, I kind of set the table, and I don't know if you were here yet, but the goal was really to focus on, like, the way, we're going to do a separate hearing on sort of what, um, 
were suggesting. Just wanted to flag that for you. Yeah, no, no I, I hear that. Still want to make my advocacy as many times as possible. This hearing, next hearing, any hearing. But just wanted to just to flag that for you. And then my, my last question is, uh, when it comes to um, COVID or ARPA dollars for um, businesses, do, do businesses see this as support or a lifeline? Um, a little bit of both. Okay, um, but majority, is it w weighted one way or the other? Because I know like for so, businesses, these, these are funds that won't be available for, right. for them so, after this. And, and, and that lifeline, we, we definitely uh, have saved some businesses. We've um, allowed for businesses to restock inventory. I mean, we, we've saved quite a bit. So I, mm. I think on a, the, the, the greater side, lifeline. It's a lifeline? Very okay. much a lifeline. Thank um, you. I support consistent throughout. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Mejia. Thank you. And thank you, Deputy, for staying. I still got two more minutes, even though it's 3 o'clock. I think that the administration understands how important it is for us to have face time with folks who work within these spaces, so we do appreciate your indulgence. Um, so I'm curious about the personal care industry um, in terms of a a targeted group. I know we have a lot of supports for restaurants, but I'm just curious if you could just talk to us a little bit about that work. I know our office created the COVID Business Ready Program for barbershops and hair salon owners where we provided training and technical assistance and PPE loans, but we did that with private um, dollars and support. But so I'm curious, what role has the city played in helping to support barbershops and hair salons in the COVID Relief Ready? And is that an industry that you see potential and or can you talk to us a little bit about your work in that space well i can get you specific numbers and, and that sort of things in your district but i will give not you, citywide I, throughout the city i mm -hmm. can give that to you as well but uh in, in particular i'll give you an example of uh, a company called bold skin bay um, which was a space grant awardee uh, mbe um, opened up her second location and this is health and wellness, uh, facial, massage, and, and that sort of thing. That is an industry, and it, and it is a prevalent industry that we have here. And so we've done quite a bit of work in, in helping folks on the barbershop side, the hair salon side, during our neighborhood business walks. I mean, that, that's- How many dollars in oh, COVID let, let dollars me, have me, we me invested in barbershops I'll, and hair salons? I'll find out. Because I think that that is, an area of interest to us, okay. um, just making sure that we're able to maintain that support that they've received. And they're a high touch, you know, industry that really felt the impact of COVID. So I'm curious about, um, we held a hearing not too long ago uh, regarding a lot of the construction. So we know that construction in many ways during COVID was put on pause and there were things that were not able to happen. And so we have a lot of businesses across the city, Charlestown, you know, Dorchester, Roxbury, the whole city has been impacted by construction um, work, these small businesses in particular. And Chief Iduwu mentioned that a lot of the opera dollars have already been allocated and that you have, you know, these dollars earmarked for different things. And I'm curious, what if any, um, thinking you all are giving to that whole idea of helping to support small businesses that have been impacted by construction? Because it is COVID. There is a connection. Things got delayed, and I'm just curious, what if any dollars exist to help support these small businesses? Um, well, I'll, I'll speak to a program that we're kicking off right now, and it's an ADU um, certification program for general contractors and um, home improvement professionals. Yeah, I'm talking about specifically street contra uh, construction that impacts small businesses. So let me get that data for you. Because uh, I, I just think that there's an, there's an opportunity there. And then my last question is that, and I know, Chair, you talked about there's going to be a series of hearings so that we'll have opportunities to advocate. But I'm curious, and just from a process standpoint, I like to always have my expectations managed. Are we, as a council, once we hear what the administration has to offer, is there going to be an opportunity for us to engage the administration on whatever crumbs are left, how we can? I don't have an those? answer for you on that. I think germane to this hearing, which I filed and I'm chairing, um, is really how the majority of the money has been spent, where the rest of the money is 
what money is going to be obligated and we know there's around seven million dollars left but like we just don't have enough time in the, these brief amount of hours to go through sort of all three of those so i have focused these this hearing on those two buckets of like what's been spent okay. and what's to be obligated and then um we can either expect another hearing or a working session okay. depending on what i think would be better Thank but you. Um, i'm gonna um I'm tanya gonna... fernandez anderson is next so i want to just like sure. questions i'd like to have something you know because i know you didn't have answers to a lot of the things yeah just asked. so you know um uh, for from a process standpoint all the questions that have been asked and that have been unanswered are being written down by my policy director um, and we will check in with your <coughs> offices to make sure that you want to send us to send those questions forward so um counselor tanya fernandez anderson you're next um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for filing. Thanks for making me a co-sponsor and to my um, other co-sponsor, Councilor uh, Worrell. Um, I think I'm just interested in asking for some for some information to um, if you guys could provide them to me. Um, uh, Director uh, Wright, I'm I'm all set. I can connect with you offline. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, and I thank all of you for making the time, but again, reiterating the process is flawed. Um, hearings, I believe, should be like four or five hours to really get into stuff, but um, I understand. Also, um, I will not be policed on what, I, what references or questions I make, so um, I'll re do respect. I will be talking about whatever um, I have the right to talk about um, in, as it pertains to ARPA dollars, um, Madam Chair. Um, so my questions, one is to, um, you know, if we have any idea of, if, if we have the proposal ready for the seven million, um, you know, uh, when should we expect that filing? Um, amount, what amount, and sorry, if you could uh, write down questions if they pertain to you, because I only have like five minutes to read them, <laughs> four minutes to read them, three now. Uh, what amount will support the, our, um, in terms of, uh, like the breakdown, um, Chief uh, Grappenberger, if we can get the breakdown for the 551 million, um, 51.7 million. Um, this is great, but if I can have a spreadsheet of everything that has been allocated, spent, um, obligated, to be obligated up to now, um, that will help me compare to this presentation and understand, like, are we actually monitoring that things are being, you know, going in the right direction? If we've changed our minds, if we've created, you know, ideas, uh, why and how we get there, I think those conversations offline all can be worked out. Um, can we break down the amount of 35.7 million property acquisition to prevent displacement by neighborhood? Um, that submitted to, um, through the chair, please, would be appreciated. Um, the BPDA announced that, you know, that we had about 31 million allocation from ARPA for the Boston Water Sewer Parcel, but today I heard 29 to be split between Boston Water Sewer and Green Spaces, so I'm wondering, did that amount go down? Did the BPDA representatives misrepresent that? Um, it was in a community meeting about a year ago, and I have documents to show that amount, that they did say that amount. Um, uh, not trying to like say that I have receipts or anything like that, but I, I definitely think I'm, I didn't confuse that amount. Um, any plans to reauthorize, reallocate funds that are currently obligated or to be obligated? Do we have different creative ideas to move things in a different direction? Um, for now, that's all I got. And if you can answer in 30 seconds, go. Um, I can, thank you, Councillor. I can take what I jotted down that I think pertains to me. So you were asking uh, about the um, seven million that is to be appropriated. Um, there will be a forthcoming um, order that we, or we, I don't know if I'm using the correct term, but we, we will have to come back to this body to deal with that seven million. Um, and that'll be coming soon because that is also subject to that December 31st, 2024 obligation deadline. So we have to move on that and we'll be coming back to you in you know, somewhat short order to address that. Um, I jotted down um, looking for kind of a further breakdown of the 551.7 by project. So I think we have the public dashboard, boston.gov slash ARPA. Um, there's a spending to date dashboard that should have some of that detail that you're looking for. Um, so we can direct um, that to you and whatever it doesn't have that you're looking for, we can see if we can supply that to you. Um, is there is it a spreadsheet that I can download? I'm not sure what format it comes in, but we'll 
we'll take a look. But I don't yeah. want to go on a scavenger hunt. Yeah, no, I understand. So I want to make sure that it's I'm not pointing you into something that is not going to be helpful. Thank but you. But I understand. Yeah, um, I think those were my questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Councillor, I was just going to uh, mention on the oops, sorry on the. Um, the large sites, the water and sewer lots. So the there was 29.9 or $30 million was allocated to, to that kind of category overall. So we had divided that up basically 10 million into the three sites. And I'm pretty sure that's what was included in the um, RFPs for the three sites that the BPDA or planning department now um, so did you say 10 million per building? Per, per, yeah, per site. So tell me, and originally it was the Austin Street lot, the Austin Street lots in Charlestown, oh. um, 12C in Chinatown, and, um, and the water and sewer lots. If I could just add one quick clarification, that is for the first set of buildings. I mean, the investment in those sites is going to go well beyond the 10 million with infrastructure and multiple buildings after this. It was just to spend that first slug in those three locations. So we can probably rest assured that we'll be spending a lot more than the 10 million overall, but this was the first, like almost a down payment. Thank you, Chief. Um, is it possible that you can break down between like amounts given to CDCs, amounts given to developers? Yes. We want to look at how we're creating wealth, right, with small developers. Um, so separating those amounts and then breaking it down by neighborhood. ARPA dollars used in housing by neighborhood would really be appreciated. And yep. I do appreciate going into Charlestown and investing in affordable housing there. But then we have to look at you know mm -hmm. our BRJP policies and are we now. Are we, are we giving it to developers of color in Charlestown to build, or are we build, giving it to CDCs? And how are we doing that, and how can we do that better in the future? Sure, we can give you the breakdown of everything that's been allocated so far by site, of course, and developer that's been awarded. Thank we can you. provide that information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, so next we're gonna move to, um, we're just gonna start over in the list, but Council President Louis Jen. Everyone has gone uh, to a certain extent. Um, um, like everyone has, uh, everyone has spoken who's here. So, so we are starting over now that now that the um, small business representative is gone. We are just starting over our full list. But um, I let um, Councillor Fernandez Anderson go first since she didn't have a question for small business. So now we'll go to Council President. Uh, I guess. Sorry, you're. I'll I'll let my um, my colleagues ask questions. I think I asked my two main questions. I do, you know, um, want to follow up with some questions with uh, with Deputy Wright, but I think I've asked um, the Microsoft. I'll defer for now. Thank you. Thank you, um, <laughs> Councillor and Vice Chair Ed Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the panel again for being here. The five hundred and what thirty-eight million dollars that we already spent is that the number? Uh, we so we have spent I think it's three um, three eighty something. Spent, uh, sorry, 323.8 and have obligated um, 82.2, so that's a total of 406 that have been spent and obligated. 406, okay. Um, have we done any audits on that amount of money on ensuring that the taxpayer money was spent appropriately, that the projects were used, the money was used for what they said they were used for, um, that the taxpayer taxpayers' funds were appropriately spent. Has any of that type of audits been done uh, by the city or the state? Um, so we have very strict requirements that we get from the federal government in terms of how funds can be spent. Um, you know, we re rely a lot on our department partners as well as, you know, the recipients to help us in some of that reporting. So in terms of like a comprehensive audit, I'm not aware of anything that we as the city have done, um, but we, you know, work with our department partners again to, you know, ensure that that funding is both, you know, going um, allowable under the treasury guidelines and, you know, they're following any reporting requirements that we have. Was there any questioning, um, questionable spending that took place um, or anything inappropriate that took place during um, 
during this period of time? Not that, not that I'm aware of. Sheila, anything? I'm not aware of anything. I mean, we're really trying to follow very, very closely the categories that were put forth when the, at the very beginning of the process and, and feel good that we have done that. Thank you. Sheila, um, tell me about 12C. What's the uh, latest? 12C. So 12C is a, is a very large, wonderful project in, in Chinatown. Um, and it is, um, it has gone through its approvals at planning. It has, as you know, it has wide support. It is both rental and home ownership. And um, we feel uh, it, it, it is experiencing some delays because of R1. So uh, the state has been hesitant to funding new projects in Chinatown until R1 begins construction. And R1 is the, the library, uh, as you know, the library housing project. So we, R1 right now is out to bid, which we're thrilled about. Uh, so they've got all of their permits, all of their, all of their working drawings. They're out to bid. And so once they come get bids back, and hopefully they're within the ballpark, once that starts construction, then they're going to be more able to convince the state that they're ready to start uh, 12C. So um, Giantown has multiple projects. So in case we have to move money around uh, it, within those within Chinatown, we feel like we can do that and still, you know, make sure that 12C happens. Sorry, it's a, it's a, it's, I, I apologize. It's a little bit of a puzzle, um, as development sometimes is. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, Sheila. Um, we didn't have the BHA um, administrator here today, did we? we, we no. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say um, that Joel is here if you have any questions for the BHA. Yeah, I, I, do, I do have a question for the BHA. Hi, hey, Joel. Hi, Councillor. Uh, good to see you. Uh, good, good to see, see all the members of the council. Um, tell me what we're doing, Joel, with the federal funds supporting tenants, supporting residents of BHA, especially in older buildings. Was there any funds used to upgrade systems such as HVAC, heating, supporting residents? Uh, give, us, give us an idea of what you guys have done over the last several years, Joel. Thanks so much, Councillor. So um, I'm extremely grateful to the Mayor and Council's investments here in BHAs. Um, the largest the project that came over to BHA is a $32 million allocation for healthy housing, and that is primarily for uh, a combination of energy efficiency, like windows improvements, as well as ventilation. In a number of older buildings across the city um, and BHA-owned properties, um, we, they're both inefficient and also um, could use improvements to ensure people have a healthy, wonderful place to live, and that is precisely what we're doing. So we have um, millions of project dollars worth bidding currently, um, and we'll have those under contract to be constructed um, improvements over the next uh, two years. Thank you, Joel. Joel, are we using any of the funds for um, elevator maintenance? It's a critical issue in, in my district, but I think it's across the city. Um, we did some work at St. Patolf Street, as you know, as Sheila was up, very helpful. Um, but West Dedham Street is, is a major problem, major concern. And that's and, um, and Joel, I'll let you answer that, but um, we are out of time. Councillor Flynn? Um, Thank you, Councillor, and, and we completely agree that elevator maintenance and uh, infrastructure repair there is a critical priority. Um, the short answer is that ARPA funds are not um, dedicated for that purpose. Um, what I will say quickly, if you'll permit me, Madam Chair, the BHA is dedicating HUD federal capital funds for elevator repair uh, through multiple sites, including you know the Ruth Barkley Apartments and others around the city. Uh, we've also had support thanks to the uh, city um, capital uh, I think $4 million in the recent capital plan investments, as well as a million dollars that Senator Collins was able to support through the housing bond bill. So uh, more to come on that, but we are using both city, uh, federal, city, and state funds, uh, all three, to work on that uh, expensive and incredibly important uh, challenge. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I guess I have no more time to ask questions. I was, I was rudely cut off. I had more questions. But.
I wanted to ask more questions about BHA issues, Madam Chair. We are going to have a second round. Um, you were about uh, two minutes over, so I just wanted to respect my colleagues and keep moving. But thank you so much, Vice Chair, for um, your questions. And uh, next, we'll move to Councillor Braden. You have the floor in four minutes. Um, thank you. Um, let's see where this handout is. <laughs> the uh, this is one for. Um, Vineet about um, the the issue with um, you said that there was two hundred two million tra traffic coming and street safety, but you also mentioned it wasn't connected with the safety surge. Like, how does that um, you, how does that work? Because I know during COVID we saw a lot of speeding in our side streets and our traffic, a lot, a lot of increased yep. issues with tra speeding. And I'm just wondering how do those two things relate? Yeah, I was just putting the two million in, in the context of our overall safety efforts. Yeah. Of which the, the safety surge uh, speed humps program is kind of the principal uh, instrument that we use to for safety in our on our neighborhood streets. So this particular amount was for a specific program in in the streets that I mentioned in in the slide. Mm -hmm. I was just saying that. That's a small piece of what we do citywide for safety. Okay. So, and, and then I understand that the safety surge is probably not going to reach Alston Brighton until 2026. Like, is that, uh, that doesn't seem reasonable. I'll have to look at the overall schedule. I'm not, yeah. uh, off the top of my head, familiar with uh, how it's. Uh, I know we had a long conversation about the hard to recycle materials, the Charm Center, and it seems it's landed. You found a location for it at, at Frontage Road. Uh, I'm wondering, because Frontage Road is well recognized as a place that's with climate change, it's going to be subject to um, flooding and uh, difficulties with uh, rising seawater. Um, are we has, have those issues been brought, taken into account? Like rather than just just rushing to find somewhere to put money. Have we evaluated that particular aspect of that location? Yeah, I can get you more details, but my understanding is that the consultant team that we are hiring will be doing site planning work, and that's a really good point that you make, and we'll make sure that those kinds of issues and are addressed when the consultant team actually starts their work. And then I had a question for um, Chief Grafenberger about um, in the, in the uh, dockets that we approved way back when, uh, City Council, we directed money towards non-profits and um, probably thinking about it in, uh, more critically, uh, um, the, did we have competitive grants for those monies or was it earmarked specifically for specific non-profits at the time? I'd have to get back to you for certain. I would expect that they were all competitively Done competitively, but I'm, I, I'm. That, that would be my guess. But I, let me confirm with yeah, you. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm, am I out of time, Madam Chair? No, you have a minute. Wow, I've got a, I've got a minute. <laughs> Keep going. Um, yeah, and um, also back to probably back to my con Councillor Flynn's uh, I I issue questions about just um, the remaining money we have. We have money spent funds, we have funds obligated, and then we have funds to be obligated to the tune of 145, 100, almost 145 and a half million dollars. How, how do we, you know, when we set, we set out to, how do we obligate those? Are, are there earmarked, are there identified projects that that money is going to be spent on, or are we, st are we still in that pr process of generating um, projects? Yeah, so no, we are not in the process of generating projects. Um, I think you know some of what you heard today is trying to make sure you have an understanding and this body has an understanding of how it is we will obligate that money between now and the end of this calendar year. So um, on page seven of the presentation, you can see a majority of that um, money, um, 97, 95 million is in housing and um, you know Sheila and Rick have shared some of their plans for that. Um, and then you know also in economic opportunity inclusion, climate mobility and arts and culture. So we are executing on the priorities that were put forward when the mayor and city council appropriated these funds and we have every expectation that we'll be able to obligate by, by the deadline. end of this year. It ha we have to obligate it by the end of this year and then we have to spend it by the end of 2026. Correct. 
And then we have the, the joy of trying to find some project, like we have $7 million left to play, to play with in terms of identifying future uh, other, other obligations, is that correct? That's right, so we have $7 million, and again, we're still on that same deadline for that, you know, to obligate that by the end of the year, so I think as we're thinking about it, um, it's gonna be really important to, in whatever, you know, the mayor and, and, and you all choose, to really put that towards something that can be obligated by the end of this calendar year. Um, so I think it's, you know, things that are up and running, things that exist today, um, so we can make sure we get that funding obligated in time. Okay, thank Tanya, you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor. Tanya Fernandez-Anderson. Thank you so much, um, Sharon Durkin. No, okay, Madam Chair. <laughs> Come on, people, laugh a little. So, <laughs> people don't realize we're always laughing together. We're always laughing so, together. So, good. Yeah, thank you um, so much. Madam Chair, you know I love you. So, I uh, think that uh, it sounds like there's a lot of money and you guys would be open to talking to Council Anderson to bring it all to D7. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> um, I would like to um, connect with you, especially um, Chief Dillon. Um, the non-factory is, uh, I think, an opportunity. We can revisit that RFP. Okay. Um, housing, I really think that we can uh, preserve that landmark and still do housing there. Um, just a commercial flat space is like, why? Um, so I see, I, I, I can think of a thousand things where you could spend that money, but um, I don't have any other questions, Madam Chair. Um, I just look forward to, you know, following up, getting some information, doing my part. Um, Vineet, great job. Um, really like that you use my idea for the, for the voucher program. It's not my idea. <laughs> I, like, I like that voucher program for the electric bikes. Um, you know, I love that. Um, I just, you know, I wish I could get one. But um, thank you so much, and we've been working together, and it's been working beautifully. Looking forward to more. Um, and of course, um, Chief Ortega, um, amazing, amazing, amazing work. You need so much money. Let's take some money. I don't know which, which one of you guys want to give money up and give it to arts, um, <laughs> and everything would be OK. So um, thank you all for your work, and thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, next, we'll go to Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just looking at the uh, appropriations to date, I see some that uh, the FY22 and FY23 revenue replacement. I just could, just a definition. I just want to make sure I understand exactly what revenue replacement means. Sure. So basically, kind of high level, um, one of the eligible uses for ARPA funding was, you know, a lot of cities and towns across the country experienced a revenue drop as a result of the COVID pandemic. There was a particular formula that US Treasury put out to say, if you meet this threshold, you can utilize some amount of funds to kind of backfill revenue loss. Um, and we met that threshold, and so we were able to appropriate or you know um, backfill some $95 million in, in, across two budgets so, yes. for revenue replacement. Great, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, is there a way to use, I know there's remaining, and I don't know what has been used on sort of like uh, public health um, and thinking about, um, you know, I, I guess what I'm asking is I know there's $7 million left. I know that we've got some uh, room to jockey for what that $7 million can be used for. And, and thinking and about- And you know we're not talking about it in this hearing, mostly about the first two buckets, which are how we spent it and how we're spending it. So. Right, but I guess my only question here is, can it be used for community health centers or urgent care? Because I'm thinking about the need for that area, especially with closings of said hospitals in certain areas, um, and the need for the community to have that. Sure, um, I don't have an exact answer for you today. I think you know we'd have to look at a particular proposal and match it up against the eligibility requirements to see. Um, but we can, you know, certainly follow up with you if there's a particular thing. Yes, there would, there would be, so I'd love to follow that up. Um, was any upper money, and this is just for my own edification, was any upper money used for 900 Morrissey when they put the Pine Street in? Did he, I? Yes. There was, how much of that was, do we know? Yeah, no, no rush. Yeah. Trying to think if I have anything else related to that while you guys are looking, but. Not, um, $9.5 million right. to create 99 units of supportive housing. 
Thank you, Chief Dillon. I appreciate that. Um, Chief Elliott Ortega is the the library. I, I remember getting a uh, questionnaire about public art going out in front of the Adams Street Library and what you would want it to look like. And I thought it was great. Like, you know, they gave little uh, different, you know, would you like this thing, this thing, what colors, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it was awesome. Is, was, is that all through the ARPA money you have, or is that through a separate? No, that's actually through our Percent for Art program, which takes a portion of the city's capital budget and allocates it to um, for us to commission yep. long-term artworks. So um, that is in the works now. It's moving ahead. So you should see something soon. We'll see at, at the Adams Street Library specifically? Yeah. Great. Can't wait. Um, the uh, uh, Just a second. Um, Council Braden, specific, can, can any ARPA money go to specific nonprofits? Because I feel like what I've heard lately is that it, it could not. Um, or did any money, any city money uh, that typically maybe have happened, that has occurred in the past that some, some nonprofits have approached me and said, the city always used to give us money and now they don't, right? Um, and we've been told that that is not allowed. Um, and so just wondering if any ARPA money did, does that fall under that same category if there's certain a threshold that has to be met? Uh, I don't know the answer, right? Uh, but so just to Council Braden's point, I second that her question there. And then um, lastly, I think, um, oh, the speed bump program that we have, yeah, you, you're here, so thank you very much for being here. Um, has any ARPA money been put into that? Because I know it's a huge request we get. And in the past, has that been ARPA? And if so, how much? Yeah, to, to my knowledge, we are not using ARPA money for our speed bump program. Could it, could it be? Potentially, I can I can definitely find out you yeah. know uh, from our budget directors here as well. Yeah, and uh, we can definitely explore that. But we are uh, well funded with the uh, city's capital budget and operating budgets at this point. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that'll be it for now. Thank you, Councillor um, Councillor Colada Zapata. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to confirm, we don't have anybody from Energy, Environment, and Open Space here to answer questions? No, and there's a couple of other um, areas of interest that people did want to hear from. So if there are questions for those individual chairs or um, chiefs, I'm happy to send those along. Will there be multiple hearings to ask some questions? Because I have specific questions about climate and mobility. I can't and, and confirm that they would attend that any future hearings, but there is. we are planning to have future conversations. OK, I, I hope there are future um, conversations, just talking about fiduciary responsibility and, and oversight of every single dollar. I just want to make sure that the the office of the new office of climate resilience, for example, is is either utilizing this or is not, and that's an area that's of um, a concern for me, and so not concern, but of interest to me. So I would like to ask those questions, and additionally for the uh, 95 million for core city services. So just putting that out there, that I I, I would like to ask those questions uh, to folks. And um, I don't know if anybody can speak to that generally about the 95. We'll just go with the core city services, how that's going, if there's going to be any information, because it wasn't in this packet. At least it could be provided in a written format. Yeah, so the 95 million is the revenue replacement. So I believe in the fiscal year 2022 budget, we used 40 million in revenue replacement. In 2021, 55 million. So it, that 95 is just those two total values that were used to sort of. Um, supplement our general fund and our, and our budget. So it didn't go to anything in particular. It was just um, a, a source of revenue to support the operating budget in those two fiscal years. OK, got it. And is there anything from the Environment, Energy, and Open Space Cabinet that we can look at that's in a presentation or in written format? Um, not that we have today. Um, on our um, dashboard, our publicly available dashboard, boston.gov slash ARPA, you can access it through there. There's a link. Um, you can you know, look and see all of the projects that are um, by department and how much um, was allocated to those projects. So that's something you could look up very easily. If there's anything in particular you want to dig further on, we can you know, certainly work with you all to get that information. But we don't have anything here today. OK, thank you. Uh, when it comes to housing, so I'll just go rapid fire because I have limited time. So really excited about the Blue Line portfolio. It's something that we need to replicate and very excited to see that there's additional funds. It said in the packet that there was $35.7 million committed to acquire and convert these market rate units and take them off of the speculative market. Um, can you just elaborate on that a little bit more? And if you could dig a little bit further to talk about what the investment per unit looks like for that um, and then how much money we have left to spend. And if that's a follow-up via email, I'm, I'm happy to, to wait for that. Sure. So um, 
There we have spent, as as um, is noted, thirty seven million dollars in change um, across many neighborhoods, uh, and we have taken three hundred and thirty two units off the speculative market. Blue Line, East Boston, Roxbury, Brighton, um, Norfolk, which is scattered, Chinatown, Fenway, Hyde Park. So really, uh, you know, taking acquisition, making acquisitions throughout the neighborhood. What was the per unit? Uh, 111,000 uh, per unit, which if you're tracking the creation of affordable housing these days, that is a bargain. Um, so working with really good for-profits and non-profits to make this happen. So um, Rick, I'm just going to ask a clarifying question if I may. Is this 44 million the amount we have? That was the, that was the, yeah, the original budget. So we, Council, we, ha uh, we have $44.5 million allocated to that program and we have spent 37 million of it. So we have some, um, some funding to go. In fact, we are looking at um, working with some of the real um, the organizations and, and developers that have been doing a really good job to see if we can't allocate to them so they can make future acquisitions. Yeah, and it was 111,000 per unit. Yes. That's a bargain. That is a bargain. If we could expand this program, that is a major investment in, in the city of Boston. We need to put more money into this yeah. long term. I can't agree with you more. It's a great Thank program. You. These are tenanted buildings, so the tenants are safe. We create affordable housing. We, I mean, the housing exists, so the neighborhood is very used to it. They don't feel like they're, you know, uh, it, they feel like the, we don't have to worry about like citing new housing. It's, it's just a win, win, win. So Thank yes. you so much, Chief, and I'm sorry to, to move forward so quickly. Uh, neighborhood food systems, should I ask you that question, Chief, about, about neighborhood food systems? Please. Okay. So there was, um, we were, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald and I were lucky enough to go to the BMC Rooftop Garden and explore it, and it's excellent. Thank you for the investment of $140,000. Um, what does it look like to replicate that across the city? I'm trying to expand access to whole nutritious food in close proximity to folks, and we're gonna need to do this moving forward, just thinking about the food system generally and topsoil and the lack of yeah. nutrients in the soil. So um, what is what are the qualifications for applying for this sort of money, and sure. what are you considering as you invest? So this? This, the, it was great to have the ARPA money, and I and I just love the Grow Boston team. They're out there making new gardens and, and raised beds and rooftop gardens. Uh, we will continue to fund through operating, through, through our grassroots program, through CDBG, more gardens, uh, more, more uh, farms, and certainly more rooftop gardens. Um, I would, the, tech, the technical, what, what you need to do a rooftop garden is probably beyond what I, what I know, but I would love to set up a meeting with Shawnee Fletcher, our director, and yourself in your office, just so you can, she can really give you the specifications so we can all be on the lookout for what, what might work. Um, we were looking at some school rooftops, we were looking at other institutions, so we'd love, to, we'd love everyone thinking about what's next. Thank you, that was my time, Mike. Oh, you're over by Sorry. two minutes. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I know. It's like when you're in the middle of questioning, it's hard to, it's hard to, and I didn't want to interrupt because I know you were um, going about some things that you're very passionate about. And um, so I will um, move to um, Councilor Rorell. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chief Dillon, how much of the $50 million um, emergency rental relief fund is still available. Can you repeat that? Uh, the emergency rental relief fund. How much of that is still available? Was that? Are you talking? Is that the small business program? We didn't use any ARPA funding for. I think that might have been the small business rental. That's relief a, fund. a small business grant. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So we yes. we had. Um, it, it was actually part of ARPA, but, but a different part of ARPA. We did get funding for emergency rental assistance. Um, that I think we're spending the last of that right oh, now. Okay. How much? Yeah. How much of that is still available? The no, emergency think, assistance that you guys have. I think it's um, it's it's part of our tenant stabilization fund now. I think it's down to a few million, two million maybe um, that we're still that we're still um, working through. We do have a few more years to spend that, but I think it'll be gone by the end of this fiscal year. Okay, and through the chair, can I can you get the exact dollar amount of that fund that's still available? Yep. And we did just get a million dollars in this last operating budget for that 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 use as well. So we can get you the total by source and, right. and what's left. Sure. Perfect. Sure. Um, and uh, Vinny, quick question for you. Um, um, I know that we extended the free fare uh, for, for the next two years. Uh, what, what's the cost over the next two years for the free fare? It's approximately the same that we had for the last two years, which is about $8 million.
Eight million per year? Yeah, eight to nine million. Okay, and then we only have- No, uh, for two years. Oh, for the two years? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, so we feel like the $10 million that we have allocated will be able to cover yes. the two years. Yes, and uh, we are tracking month by month uh, the exact expense uh, or other cost so, so we can keep track, so we can make sure we have enough funds. Awesome. Um, and then a uh, quick question for uh, uh, CFO Groffenberger. I, I know we've reallocated um, ARPA dollars in the past. Can you just explain to me uh, the process? Are those obligated funds or unobligated funds that are able to be reallocated? And how, what's the process internally that um, brings up something for reallocation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's also a little bit connected to how the original authorization was written in the particular order that authorized the funding. Um, so it's a little, it, it, there's not sort of like one clear answer. I think um, we came back a couple of months ago to reallocate money, money away from, I think, a streets project to um, the food hub. Um, that, so that was one way, and that required council action. There are other instances where the funding authorization is broad enough that um, we're able to reallocate internally. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of just depends on how the funding how was funding. originally authorized. Okay. And uh, when it comes to, like, the paperwork um, in terms of being obligated, do we ever get anything rejected and say, you know, the paperwork um, was not sufficient enough, uh, does not meet the requirements of, you know, the obligation standard? Yeah, um, not that I'm aware of. I think uh, at this point, a couple of years in, our auditing team is really excellent at making sure we're submitting and reporting um, correctly. Um, I also think, you know, U.S. Treasury is also learning as they're going and are, you know, constantly helping to revise and clarify guidelines. I think they have an, uh, an incentive for the funding to get spent as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm not aware of any instance where we've had something um, rejected as not being obligated. All right. And knowing that we have what, three, three months um, to, you know, for a proposal and then also obligation, do we have a timeline on when we'll have a proposal in front of us? For the seven million? For the seven million. Yeah, I mean, it's going to have to be, you know, very soon. Uh, I don't have an exact timeline for you, but um, we're really focused on that year-end deadline to appropriate and obligate, so it will have to be in pretty short order. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Um, next, we're going to go to Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm curious if you can just talk to me about your evaluation process. Um, what has been your metrics on those return on investments? Like, are you doing uh, quarterly check-ins with these nonprofit organizations that you've allocated funding to? Can you kind of walk us through what your evaluation platform looks like? Sure. So I think there's kind of different layers of um, evaluation. You know, we have 119 programs, over half a billion dollars, so it's a lot of money. Um, we set aside um, about $2 million in the original um, appropriation for evaluation. Um, we have since brought on, in the last couple of months, um, an evaluator onto, uh, I think, in partnership with the Department of um, Technology, um, who's going to be doing an incredibly deep, robust quantitative dive on um, a, a few select programs. I'm so sorry I did not bring them today because I can't remember off the top of my head which ones they are, but we will have a really um, in-depth evaluation on those programs and I'm happy to follow up and, and, and give you information on what those are. So there's that like really robust technical evaluation that's going on, I think departments also um, as the kind of custodian of these funds and getting money out the door um, have their own evaluation and reporting that they do um, to ensure that we're getting a good return on investment. Um, there's also, um, you know, various um, diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics that we track as well. Um, there's reporting that departments will do to us on a semi-regular basis that talk about the populations that they have yeah. served. Yeah, because I, I think I do remember when you first made your presentation and your pitch for the dollars that you wanted, you led with a racial equity mm -hmm. lens in mm -hmm. terms of your evaluation and how you were going to measure success was really with the racial right. equity lens, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. 
that's kind of where I'd like to see in terms of when you do your presentation. Sure. Kind of leading with, with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also curious about this timeline, and it seems a little bit aggressive. And I'm not sure how we ended up here now in almost October, and we're trying to expedite a process. And I'm sure you know it's for a lot of reasons, and I want to always assume best intentions, but I'm just curious. Um, and this is just a question that I have, and I'm just trying to help myself understand your process here. Is your vision to come to us with a proposal? Because I know the last time we went through this process, there was an effort where counselors actually got to participate collectively. That's why we were able to get the immigrant liaison role. We were able to secure $750,000 for rental assistance for our municipal employees. We were a part of that process. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what is your game plan for engaging the city council before you come here with a proposal? I'm just curious what, what that looks like. Um, so I can say very high level. I mean, we just came off of a budget process where we heard a lot of the priorities of, you know, community in this body, you know, things around housing, small business. Um, so we, you know, have just come off of that process and I think we have a good sense of, or, you know, we, we, we you know, engage in that dialogue as part of that process. So um, I think, you know, as to your question about timeline, this is just such an extraordinary amount of money that we had to get out the door. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were spending the money that we had appropriated um, wisely. And now at this point where, you know, you note that we are kind of getting down to the wire, wanting to put that, you know, kind of marry council priorities with the highest and best use of what we have seen work um, so far. So, because I, I think as part of your evaluation, since you're just bringing someone on to do it. I'm just curious about how many dollars are still out in these streets that these organizations did not use, right? Like, that level of understanding of what, I know you're reporting to us that we have seven million left, mm -hmm. but, you know, as part of your accounting and your evaluation, it would be helpful to know if the dollars that have gone out the, out the door, how have they been used? Yeah. Is there still money on the table? Um, those are all things that I still feel like are unclear to me. So if you have any insight, I would appreciate it. Sure, yeah, and I'd love to also send you our um, year-end report, which talks a little bit about, I think, the evaluation piece and sort of the, um, the um, equity lens that you're referring to. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, any dollars, any things that are left over, I mean, again, we're talking about an enormous amount of money. It's a huge moving target. You know, things are going out, you know, cars got uh, uh, things going out this week, right? So we're, and trust me, our office has a huge vested interest in ensuring that we're spending everything. So we're, you know, tracking and making sure we're, you know, we're seeing the spending happen um, in as real time as we can to ensure that things are going out the door and where we have an opportunity to move it along that we're, we're playing that role. Right, and, and my last question, because I I'm know my sorry. time is up. Oh, okay. my time. It, it already is up, but um, if, I'll I was going to be, a, thank you, I appreciate it. I was just going to ask about gig workers in terms of kind of what, I, see, I think this whole process was just emergency, right? I'm thinking about sustainability and long term, so I'm just curious around the gig econ economy. What, what, what are you thinking of in terms of the long-term investments for this particular industry because I know they were hit hard and now they're just coming back into the scene and so how how are you, what's your vision for for that moving forward yeah so we've um, we have this RFP. Oh, sorry Bye. let's make sure your mic is on right. we've got this RFP going out next week for technical assistance and this is really the focus so we'll have somebody on board um, for uh, I think a year and a half um, who will coordinate like a full calendar of workshops, one-on-one -on -one support, um, opportunities for people to explore different business models. So I think something that we've seen a lot is artists and creative workers having to create new ways of collaborating together. We have a lot of people interested in co-ops and just different structures. Um, and so helping um, put some capacity behind people so that they can figure out how to work together, what it looks like to handle contracts, like all of the nitty gritty um, how to apply for grants um, that people need in order to make those careers really sustainable. Um, so that'll be, we're also trying to do that with an eye toward where, like who owns that going forward. 
um, because we really need that, like an organization or an entity in our ecosystem that's really taking that on and providing those services. So that'll be a big contract, and we're hoping that um, whoever um, gets that and who we wind up working with is somebody who we could work with in the future, too. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, next, we'll go to Council President Louis Chen. Thank you. Um, oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question's um, turned, and I want to make sure that I ask. I just have a question off of, based off of Councillor Orell asked about uh, the 28 bus pilot. Thank you, Vinique, for all the work that you do. I think it's really important when we're thinking about street design, really um, incorporating what uh, our residents most care about but about this pilot specifically the MBTA just you know launched their um, income based uh, reduced fare program and I'm assuming a lot of the ridership on 23 28 29 would qualify so I wonder how and if we've been thinking about how that will impact how much money we're paying out for this program yep. Yep. Thank you, that, that's a very good question. And we have started conversations with the MBTA because you're right, there would be many people who currently mm -hmm. take the 28. The super majority. The yeah, super majority yes. who would uh, qualify to get that half fare off. And so it gets a little complicated to actually figure out how the two programs are going to work together. Yeah. But it's something that we have been aware of even while the T was developing yeah. the program, so uh, hopefully we'll find the right way to kind of strategically figure it out. I just think it's an argument for us to pay them less. I'm sorry? I think it's an argument for us to pay them less. Right. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then I just had a question about, um, uh, I had some uh, evaluation and compliance questions that some of my colleagues have asked, but it looks like the total budget for compliance is $3.6 and only 320000 has been spent so far. What is the timeline for utilizing these funds? Is this delta about positions that we have to hire, what do the ARPA compliance positions look like for the city of Boston? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and, the, and I think those are my questions. Yeah, um, thank you. So I think it, the way it breaks down, it's about three, uh, sorry, two million for evaluation and the remainder is for the administration. So we have, you know, hired some um, in my shop, um, ARPA implementation directors and analysts to help uh, um, with all of this work and this reporting work. So. Um, we expect to, ob you know, uh, obligate that money through um, the end of the year. For evaluation or for compliance? For, uh, for both. Um, so the evaluation piece, um, we, like I mentioned, we brought on um, an evaluator some number of months ago. Um, we've kind of just finalized the evaluation plan, so we'll be able to obligate those funds um, now that we know kind of like what data sets we need to buy and um, what. We're not able to obligate funds. I thought that the, that the holdup for obligating funds was really like not having an RFP. I didn't know if it was that it was the particular details. It's it's not being in contract or you have to either be in contract or okay. have a purchase order in place. So okay. now that we know what things we need to contract for or buy, because we have an evaluation plan, we'll be able to, you know, get those things obligated shortly. Okay. okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Council President. Um, next we'll go to actually I have a couple questions and then and then we'll start this up for a um, second round. Second, third, you know, um, depending on how you look at it. Um, so, um, uh, Chief Dillon, I understand um, and am totally aligned that housing is like the biggest need facing our city. Um, and I'm really aligned with the way that the money has already been spent. But also a lot of the obligated, unobligated funds um, are um, in housing, um, and I know that housing is probably the most tricky to obligate and probably the, the, tr the trickiest to start um, moving on. So I was just curious, um, how can we ensure that all of the money that is allocated for housing and all of the money that is not yet obligated for housing like, is actually able to be used before 2026? It's, it's a very good question, and, it, and it, it doesn't keep us up at night because I think we've got a pretty good plan. I think, you know, a few months back it was, um, but 
I do feel very, very confident that for every number that is not obligated yet, there is a plan A and a plan B. Um, and I, we, because you're absolutely right, and the reason, um, and I'm sure this is there, other cities are feeling this as well, you know, to get uh, a new project, a new uh, affordable housing project off the ground, you've got community process, you've got permitting, you've got, you know, lots of neighborhood dialogue, and then you've got lots of leveraging other sources of funds and trying to make them, you know, I think everyone has been, our partners have been very, very um, thoughtful, and they've been working really hard because they know that we're on ARPA schedules. So there is a lot of uh, components that are outside our control, but we have been really wrestling those to the ground. Um, Rick has been spearheading internally meetings every week now on the ARPA spend, and if, I, if it's okay with you, I just want to give him you know, a minute or two just to talk about that process and where we are with, with the making sure the obligations happen. Yes. Hi, th thanks, Jilla. Yeah, um, we have somebody on staff, uh, Lily Ibarra, who's been leading. We hired, brought her on board to help us um, keep track of all of our ARPA projects and make sure they're moving forward. So. Um, she and myself and our budget team, like Sheila said, meet every week, but we're talking with our program staff way more frequently than that. Um, I was just looking at our, you know, we have a spreadsheet. We love our spreadsheets in finance um, where we, we're, we're tracking all our projects. Um, and, you know, of the, as of June 30th, Ashley reported we were at 95 million. As of, I think, last week was the last time we updated this, we were at 82 million. Um, of that 82 million, um, in our department, um, you know, we have, uh, you, you wish an RFP, then you make an award. That's, not, that's still not an obligation. You make an award, then you, then you encumber the funds with a contract or a loan, or we do a lot of funding through loans and grants. Um, so of the 82 million, we have 48 million has already been awarded. So we've already awarded the funding to a project, and now we just have to move to the next step of, of signing, signing a, a, um, a contract or a loan or a grant. 23 million, we have projects um, selected, but we, ha we just haven't taken that step of either issuing the award, award letter and or um, signing, a, signing a document. Um, and then 11 million, so it's only 11 million where we're still kind of doing final reviews of things. So um, again, I, it, I feel like we're it's September 4th. Um, I, I won't lie, I mean, yes. I, I wish we were further along than we are right now, of course, uh, given only you know, less than four months left to obligate the funds. But I do feel like we have a really um, good plan. Like Sheila said, we have, if any, if any of these hit any bumps, we have a list of you know, alternative projects that we can, um, that we can um, slot in. Thank you. And this is a very, very elementary question, but once the money has been awarded to a nonprofit or a uh, developer in a neighborhood, um, does that, I mean, obviously, does work have to start prior to 2026, or just does the money just have to be awarded prior to 2026? The money has to be spent by the end of 2026, so it has to be fully expended. And obviously, um, having watched a lot of development projects in my district, like that does give me anxiety about yeah. this particular pot of money. Um, obviously, I think we do have really great people at the helm and really great people working on this. Um, but it is each individual project, I think, has its own timeline and ha may fall into its own quagmires. So trying to predict those and get ahead of them, um, especially given that r particular real estate environment that we're in right now. It's a, it's a very fair question. And one thing we have been doing with some frequency or getting ready to do is providing our money up first for ac the acquisition of the site and then close on the other financing and the construction loans, et cetera, et cetera. So we have been trying to get make sure that our money is spent even if the project isn't fully closed and in construction. So there's, there's ways around it too, and we do that sometimes anyways, just because our money is cheaper than bank money, especially working on affordable housing projects. So, so um, there are ways yeah. for them to utilize the financing that we are offering, and, or this ARPA money first, yes. Yes. prior to other cap. The, that other that cap is correct, staff. not in every single instance, but in many, yes, that is the case. And of course, we're holding back until we know all the other financing is lined up. We're talking to the state, we know sure they've got their operating money, we know that they're a strong team. So we're not, we're not getting out in front and caught in, in, a, in a risky situation, but we, sometimes we are getting out first. Because I'm just imagining a purchasing order that's creating another purchasing order that's creating another purchasing order, just in the sense of like, the, the ways in which, the steps that may be needed to build affordable housing, though I've never done it, we're becoming a little more versed on it at the <laughs> city level. So thank you so much, I uh, really appreciate it, and thanks. Um, 
Next, uh, we'll hear from um, Madam Chair. Yes. Question. I'm um, sorry. I was okay with it. I I was. I'm actually second. I'm not third. I'm not after Councillor um, Braden. I'm before. But I do have a hard stop. Is it okay if I just make one final? Are you okay with that, Councillor Braden? Okay. I was. I was second. I left you getting water in the hallway. Remember? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Go um, ahead. Thank you so much. <laughs> sorry. I really have to go to a meeting. Um, I'm really curious about um, evaluation and administration. And um, 3.6 million does seem excessive. Um, and it does feel a little backwards that we spend it and then we're gonna evaluate whether or not we were equitable about it. Um, and we brought up this point, we had reduced, well, we went back and forth in hearings. It was originally proposed 5 million. And we were like, that's crazy. And then now we went down to 3.6. Um, that amount really just sort of came as a lump sum along with the other recommendations. Um, I am very curious to know about, you know, have you followed BRJP policies in terms of the contract? And I don't, and I mean, I mean black and brown people. I mean um, contractors that you're bringing in. So within itself, it would seem an oxymoron if you then go and don't contract a black and brown um, contractor to do the very evaluation to ensure equity. Um. Understand the question. I don't know if I have a perfect answer for you. To, I don't know. I don't who know who have you we contracted? have. Yeah, I, I don't have that information today. So, like I said, we brought on an evaluator um, into the city, a single person, and then that person is in charge of you know um, setting forward the evaluation plan. So, I'd be happy to follow up with you on sort of what that evaluation that, as I was saying to Councilor Mejia, that sort of um, very rigorous evaluation plan that that person is going to lead on a um, you know subset of our um, ARPA programs. Was it an application, some sort of contract, some sort of RFP put out? For, to bring on the evaluator? Um, I'm not sure. I think it was a, I, I'm not sure. It's a, it's, a, it's a staff person in the city, so um, it's a, an employee. An employee would then um, contract third party organizations to spend this 3.6. I'm just really curious about how we're spending 3.6 to evaluate. And I know that it's half a billion, but also, again, oxymoron if we are not contracting, if we're not following the very policies that we're trying to ensure. Mm -hmm. Yep, I understand. I'm happy to follow up with you on sort of what that evaluation plan is um, and you know, demonstrate how we're planning to spend down that 3.6 by the end of the year. Okay. Um, it does sound like, I mean, and, uh, Chief Dillon, I, I, again, I reiterate that I'm really interested in looking at, you know, funds. I'm sure you already have, like, ideas and budget and um, plans, but um, it does sound like there's an opportunity here for us to be even more racially equitable moving forward with whatever needs to be obligated. Sure, and we will, um, as, as you mentioned earlier, we will get... Um, we've been trying really hard, as you know, especially on our designations, to make sure that... Um, the teams really are reflective of our neighborhoods and our local, um, but would love to get you a list of the ARPA allegations that have made, allocations that have been made so far by uh, developer type and and um, and whether the M the MWBE status or uh, local status. So we we will get you that report. Okay, um, I appreciate that. Um, also, constituents have been complaining about you know that. A lot of this money has gone to CDCs where mm. the opportunity could be open. I mean, and I know that it's yeah. sort of both, yeah. but um, could be open more to smaller developers to create sure. wealth? So um, a lot of some of the resources that we've been spending on development have gone to uh, Welcome Home Boston, and those are all local, very, very diverse teams. They're not nonprofits. There's one nonprofit maybe out of looking at Council Royal, 10 or 12 teams. There's been one CDC. Um, the large sites have gone to private local development teams. So I think we really have done a, a very supportive housing. Uh, oftentimes we're working with nonprofits because the skill set they can both develop and then they provide the, the, um, the, the services, the very enriched services. But be glad to get, I think, that, I think we're very pleased with the effort that's been made so far and the, the results. Okay. Thank you so much, Councillor. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Next, we'll hear from uh, Councillor Liz Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
So there's an incredible range of um, categories, um, expenditure categories, um, all sorts of things. Uh, and I know the, the public health negative economic uh, impacts, public health e negative impacts, revenue replacement and administrative uh, co uh, categories. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, I think we had this discussion about hiring um, when we when COVID hit first and we got ARPA funds, we never really recovered from the 2008 recession because public sector jobs never really come back up to where they were before that recession. And in in Boston, we see that a lot in some departments. And it seems that one of the uh, one of the categories, public health negative and public sector workforce rehiring public sector staff. And it seems like I'm looking at, at the Venet here, and I know about our challenges at the Parks Department, like getting project managers to be able to. We have all these projects in the pipeline, and they're not going anywhere fast because we don't have the staff to execute the pro, uh, the projects. Um, is there any consideration about using some of that uh, money to really see if we can uh, hire staff to? you know, move the thing forward. Like, I know BTD is, has a very ambitious program. They're getting more and more work sent over their way now that B, B, BPDA is a city planning agency, mm -hmm. and they're offloading work to other departments within the city at this point. Um, so we, is, there a, is there an idea that we could actually use some of that money to beef up the staffing for project managers, those sort of middle manager levels to, to be able to execute some of the plans that we have. Yeah, um, so we've been very careful about using ARPA funds for hiring and only doing it in very targeted situations because this is one-time money um, and we would be concerned about creating cliffs uh, for you know people's employment, you know uncertainty that we would be able to absorb anything onto the operating budget when um, you know the, the funding expires. So we've been very careful about avoiding that where possible. But I, you know, we'd just gone through the whole budget thing, and we, we did our uh, under the leadership of our chair here. Uh, we we did the whole unspent monies for different. A lot of it was unspent personnel money, because we were not hiring, and then we're spending the money on contracted services, which are more expensive at the end of the day. Like, it, it seems like, you know, we really so to be really intentional about targeting hiring of of new of professionals to do the deliver on these project manager level jobs that, that really, we, ha we have BTD, uh, they're under incredible strain, uh, burning people out at a fierce rate. And we, you know, I think this is, this is something we really need to look at. The money's, it's a category that we can use in this, in this schedule and we haven't taken advantage of that, sadly. Yeah, I mean, I think we remain really committed to just filling the staffing we have funded for on our city operating budget and so, really, again, carefully not wanting to utilize one-time sources to, to so hire. So you're saying we don't, we don't need to use this money, but we should be doing it otherwise. We should be looking at compensation and, and classification of jobs to make exactly. sure that we're Right, we, you know, really wanting to utilize the resources we have, and you know, we, I think we've come to you before to talk about our hiring processes and things we're doing to help with recruitment, retention, those sorts of things, negotiating, um, you know, labor contracts, all of those things to really just you know rebuild the the workforce on the city side without needing to use ARPA funds. There's a few other gaps in the list here, like um, rehabilitation of commercial properties and other improvements, business incubators and startup or expansion assistance, enhanced support for micro-businesses, rehiring of public sector staff, um, you know, this, and, and then there's support for uh, sur survivor benefits, uh, cash assistance for unemployed workers, and uh, there's a lot of things here. Uh, and then uh, COVID assistance for small businesses we've done, and assistance for non-profits, but in the lineup where we know where we spent the money, this is the places we haven't spent money. So even just in terms of public health, it would be really interesting to know what um, RFPs went out and what money was allocated for support or non-profits, and our, especially our, our community health centres. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I know I've mentioned, uh, made a plug for it before, but boston.gov slash ARPA, our dashboard, you can drill in by department and see how those public health dollars were allocated. There were some that was, you know, for direct COVID response, like 
vaccines, those types of things, um, and then also some behavioral health um, programming as well. So you can drill in and see exactly yeah. um, what that was. Very good. Madam Chair, time up. Yeah, you're out of time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, uh, next, we'll go to Councillor Fitzgerald. Councillor Fitzgerald, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one question. I know that Council President Louisian was talk, uh, talking about the difference of having, you were saying the answer was to have a um, contract open or to have an RFP out, right? Those, it, it, was, a, it was a contract or? Uh, a, a purchase order. A purchase yeah. order, sorry, yes, right. A contract or a purchase order. So it, it, if and when, if the other possible uses at, around healthcare and stuff, we would have to have a contract or a purchase order. An RFP by the end of this year is how realistic? Um, right. RFPs tend to be lengthy processes, so it would be, um, you know, we're, we're... We're cutting short. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a possibility to know what contracts or purchase sources are, are open under the health uh, sort of range of, or, or would that be something maybe for Dr. Ojukutu if I were to reach sure, out to her office? Sure, yeah, I think um, having a conversation with BPHC would be yeah. useful here. I mean, I will say- um, I did at, wanna just um, chime in that I did request that um, uh, Dr. Priscilla Ojukutu be here. Yeah. She wasn't able to attend, um, so if there are any questions for her, please send them my way and I'm happy to share them. Well then, thank you, man. Uh, through the chair, that's all. If there are any, what, what purchase orders and contracts contracts we have open. Thank, thank you. you. And I think we've done a good job of getting um, a, a, a great range of, of the types of ARPA dollars that were spent, but this um, panel is not an exhaustive list of the ways that ARPA dollars have been spent. Um, so any specific um, questions that anyone has, please share them with me. Um, I am also happy to, um, to, to try to get an audience or at least a <coughs> briefing together with BPHC um, for the council if they're interested on the ARPA funds, uh, maybe separate from this hearing. Um, so thank you so much, Councillor. Um, we'll now go to Councillor uh, Gigi Coletta Zapata. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm directing my questions. Hi, Vinny. Hi. Good to see you. Um, the last time you and I saw each other, it was in Maverick, and it was soliciting feedback on a survey for the transportation corridors in East Boston. We have just wrapped a five-year exhaustive, robust uh, master plan for East Boston that included land use, residential areas, corridors, all of that. Um, I just was scrolling through Plan East Boston trying to understand what the recommendations were for, for Maverick <coughs> and how uh, this is the first time that I'm hearing about the money that was sought after for Maverick Square. And again, going to my notes. So Maverick Square, Main Street's design, you're releasing an RFP next week. It's for safety improvements for pedestrians and bikes in coordination with streets and squares, which is awesome. Um, I'm just trying to figure out like how it lines up with Plan East Boston, whether or not this was informed by Plan East, because it's not in the <coughs> policy um, document that I'm looking at right now, and when we expect for folks in the community to f help frame yeah. what this process is going to be like moving forward. Yeah, actually, the excuse me, losing my head. <coughs> the the idea for Mapping Square came from Plan East Boston because we were trying to find uh, some locations where we could spend this money in a situation where some community engagement has already been done, which was the case for Plan East Boston. So once we've uh, hired a consultant team, we'll start public engagement again with local community groups for both Rosendale and for Maverick. So you should expect that to start later in the fall. Okay, so there, we, we will let the community decide <coughs> what that's going to look like moving forward. Yeah. Uh, okay, as long as there will be more community meetings. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's already been instances in East Boston where there have been recommendations provided by Plan East Boston without going back to community members because it has been since 2019. And so, for example, in Day Square, there was conversations about activating a space out of parking spaces and 
it was under the guise of, well, people are okay with this, and, and we don't need to go back to them. So I just don't want to repeat the same mistakes that have already happened in the last <laughs> couple of months. So as long as there will be more community meetings to help folks to find what Maverick Square looks like moving forward. As a pedestrian, as somebody who doesn't have a car, I use Maverick Square quite frequently. So the fact that we could potentially have investments that make my experience on, in public spaces safer is great. Um, but I, I do want to be sure that we're providing space for community members to uh, absolutely. have their voices heard. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And then um, for uh, Cara, Chief, nice to see you. The responsive arts and cultural programs at Parish Street Community Center in East Boston, can you just expand on that, what that is, who it will serve? And what the goals are. Yeah, so this has been in partnership with BCYF and um, with input from staff at each of the centers. So the kind of question that we were wrestling with was um, what does it look like to kind of like turbocharge arts and culture programming that um, takes advantage of kind of the knowledge in the mayor's office of arts and culture and the knowledge of the folks who actually run these spaces and are in touch with these communities every day. Um, and uh, crafting this RFP to um, basically bring somebody in who can um, work with each center and with what each community, like how each community uses those centers, like what hours, is it seniors, is it young people, what are they already doing there that's creative, so really working with the information that's already on the ground and then using that to create um, uh, seasons of arts and culture programming with either teaching artists or arts organizations as providers. So the RFP, I believe, is for like the intermediary who's then going to help figure that out and then um, kind of subcontract with the arts providers in each location. Um, and I believe that um, they've selected somebody. I don't know if that contracting process is done yet or not. Um, it's being managed through BCYF. And what's the timeline on that? Like, when do you expect for the programming given the intermediate and then the subcontractor? I think for... Um, I, I would need to double check on that, but my memory is for 2025. Okay. Yeah. Let's just stay in communication on that. I think it's a great idea and, and um, want to be helpful and useful how I can to um, provide outreach for that. And then you had also talked about the affordable cultural space, and you had mentioned something about Brighton and the music hall, and you know that we, ha we held that hearing following the potential closure of yeah. Terminal Street and all of that. Can you just clarify what you had said or repeat it? Because I had missed it, and I want to make sure that I get it right. Yeah, the ARPA funding that, we're, um, that we were talking about in these slides is specific to 290 North Beacon. So this is in response to um, a site that um, a IQHQ, a developer, purchased um, just down the street. Um, that displaced music rehearsal space. So it's not um, speaking to like the need for small music venues specifically, but to this one space that had 40,000 square feet of affordable space for musicians and served hundreds of people. So when that was um, taken offline, uh, we negotiated and worked with the BPA, BPDA on what mitigation would be for that. And the developer then purchased this property down the street and is giving it to the city to be redeveloped into affordable cultural space. And so we'll be reproducing at a minimum the 40,000 square feet that was lost um, and hopefully more. And then uh, it's adjacent to a BHA site. And so we've now been working with the BHA to integrate these two processes together to get kind of the most um, public bang for our buck uh, on that project. So that's the first time we've ever done anything like that. Um, shout out to the counselor here for um, being super involved. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and uh, so it's it's exciting. It's also very very new. We've yeah we haven't um, kind of done a publicly directed capital project that creates affordable cultural space. Um, and so we're we're holding this funding um, for that project specifically. Um, I think that's the one piece of our ARPA funding that is the most. Um, uh, like that we need to figure out exactly how it's going to be obligated by the definition that um, that was shared earlier but uh, it's it's moving ahead um, so yeah no no question that we'll be able to use it um, just need to get it to the BHA shout out to Council Braden for your work on this and just I, <laughs> very quickly I'll say that I um, this is a demonstration of the city moving on a particular issue where we were going to lose rehearsal space, valuable rehearsal space in Charlestown, and it was going to be the last, and there was going to be no f place for any artist to come together to hone their craft in a space that was retrofitted appropriately for it. So just kudos to you, kudos to everybody here. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Counselor. Um, and I have a friend who is displaced from the original space, so it's actually really cool to think of um, and one, I think in terms of rehearsal space, um, it's really interesting. 
it's not something that is like district by district. It's that if you are a band or if you're someone who needs rehearsal space in the city of Boston, you'll go anywhere, but you need it to be cheap because you're an artist. And so thank you so much to everyone who worked on that. Um, what an incredible feat. And um, as we think of how we move forward with um, all of our, um, these individual buckets of money um, of both what's been allocated, what needs to be obligated, and also um, this remaining uh, money that, that we still have some ability to shape. Um, I think uh, this is just the beginning of a conversation. Um, so I wanna give my colleagues a chance um, to give a closing statement. Um, and I, and then we do have a couple of, or at least one person who is going to testify. So, um, and then I'm, I'm totally willing to let the um, administration give closing statements if you have any thoughts as well. But um, I'll just do this in order of arrival. Um, first, Councillor Liz Braden. Thank you, Thank you, everyone, for this afternoon's conversation about this very important <laughs> issue. Um, we have we have a lot. We've still some work to do, and the remaining authorization, the seven million nine thousand and thirty eight dollars, uh, we will be very interested in seeing how we can work with you all to put that to good use and to get the best bang for our buck, literally. Um, so uh, thank you all, and and thank you, Madam Chair. I look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, I think it's. When we all we all bring our heads together and we can identify projects that, and identify the needs from our communities that this money can help address, it's it's really really important that we all work together on this. So thank you, and thank you for your uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much, Councillor. Uh, next, we'll hear a closing statement from Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for all you do, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, short and sweet. Um, Councillor Coletta Zapata. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm always um, in awe of Councillor Fitzgerald's so slickness <laughs> and able to just convey a message. But I, I will just add that I am um, very grateful again for the work. Just thinking about where we've been and where we are now, the, the conversations, the hours of sitting together under the le leadership of Councillor Kenzie Bach um, at, at the time. It's just incredible to see and love seeing some of these projects come to fruition. As it relates to the seven million, I can't wait for the council to help define what we do with that moving forward and would love to have an active role in figuring out what that is um, with you, uh, Chair. So um, I'll just leave it at that and just say thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Would any of the administration panel like to say anything in closing? Um, Chief Elliot Ortega. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I just want to say thanks to the council for all the partnership on these funds. Um, and I know that um, everyone's excited about the, the funding that's remained to be allocated. And my very, very practical piece of advice would be to find grant programs that are already like established that could be adjusted or where that infrastructure could be already like used and you don't have to recreate a whole procurement process. And similarly, um, contracts or RFPs that are like you know, scheduled to go out that where there could be something adjusted. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of staff behind all these departments who are scrambling right now to try to get everything obligated. So if there's a way to leverage what already exists, um, that would be great. And then, um, and then I know that's the exciting topic. I think just a, a lot of us um, are also looking at what happens once these funds are obligated. And so I think to the extent that um, that we can have conversations in partnership with the council about what's what's next because a lot of us are um, trying to figure out, you know, we've done these amazing one-time things, so we've learned a lot of lessons, there's exciting pilots and demonstrations, and we're gonna learn a lot from all the evaluation. Um, but, you know, for Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, our funding will go from, you know, this almost like $10 million a year amount that we've had for the last three years to 4.5. Um, and so just like, you know, what, do, what are we taking from what we learned? What are we trying to build going forward? Um, and I know it's kind of crazy to think about already what comes next, because there's so much still to allocate and get out the door, but to the extent that those conversations can be had um, in this kind of upcoming year, I think that would be great. Thank you very much. 
And Chief Graffensperger, do you have any comments? No, um, nothing more to add. Um, just thank you again. Um, I, you know, I came from a city that had to use all of its ARPA funding for revenue replacement. So the fact that we here in Boston mm -hmm. were able to use over half a billion dollars for transformative new projects, I think is really exciting um, and a huge testament to, um, I think, a great partnership with everyone in this room. So thank you, and we look forward to the next 18 months. And I think that was a great way to close because um, I think my last question that I didn't have a chance to ask was really how do we measure up to other cities and what we've been able to do? And I think the resounding answer to that question is we've done so much better than other cities, uh, but we still have work to do. And hearing my colleagues, both their deliberations with the budget and with um, their deliberations today and um, in our conversations, I think it's very clear that there's a lot of interest in small business and housing, um, particularly um, in regards to um, to these funds. But just um, just how that ends up being allocated, and um, and what um, steps we're going to take, and what programs were will be funded with this all those are the details that really need to be filled in and look forward to um, working in partnership with the administration and all my colleagues to deliver um, uh, both both make sure that um, we're using every single dollar which i know is um, is on the top of everyone's minds right now but also um, how do we again um, to quote uh, Councillor Braden how do we get the biggest bang for our buck so um, I know we have um, one uh, person left for testimony but I wanted to relieve the panel um, thank you so much for being here I really appreciate your partnership um, and then we have one um, person who would like to testify Jean McClurkin um, and you can go to either microphone on the side, and you have two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Is this one on? Yes, yes, it is. Hi. So my name is Jean McClurkin. I'm the Behavior Health Director at Fenway Health. I wanted to take this opportunity to first thank the Madam Chair, thank you very much, and the counselors who have stayed. Thank you very much for staying to listen to public testimony. Um, I wanted to offer an opportunity of gap closure and what that can look like. So at Fenway Health, we have been working very hard coming out of the pandemic to provide behavioral health care proactively to people that are receiving primary care. Fenway Health is one of the 16 FQHCs in the Boston area. We are unique in that half of our population is LGBTQIA+. About one in every five or six of our patients are part of the transgender or gender diverse community, and about a third of our population is BIPOC. What we really want to do is continue to close that gap in access to behavioral health care so that every client coming in for primary care gets behavioral health care same day. That is currently something that's on a referral system. There are procedure codes and infrastructure available through insurance revenue to be able to start billing for and get a unique revenue for integrated behavioral health care. It takes work to get there. It takes funding to get there. It's something where you have to implement a system and then be able to see that return on investment. It's hard to have the infrastructure and investment to get the system off the ground. So that would be an example of an opportunity where an organization like Fenway could come and respond to an RFP and say, we have a program with bones. We have work we are doing. We need support to continue to close the gap and make it happen. The way healthcare insurance billing works, just to and offer that up to folks, is we're moving in a direction of value-based payments, which is not fee-for-service revenue. Fee-for-service revenue is what procedure codes you can bill and how many you can bill. Not so much about the quality of care you're providing or the patient satisfaction of the care you're providing. Value-based care and incentive payments really look at how have you done to move the needle of healthcare. Integrating behavioral health using models from the Washington, the University of Washington Center, the AIM Center using models through SAMHSA, ESPERT, these are tried and true models of integrated care that have been around for about 15 years. They don't get paid well. Um, that's the piece where it's not about fee-for-service revenue, it's about being able to get the value-based payments by showing improvements to your health care. But again, that takes having the staff that are paid, having the staff salaries that you can already provide so they can do the work so you can see the outcomes. 
So one of the things that Fenway, for example, would do with, say, $700,000 is be able to staff unique licensed mental health professionals. And we know we're in a healthcare shortage right now for folks like myself that are LICSWs and licensed addiction counselors. We are in rare supply. But being able to have four of those bodies, which Fenway already has on staff, being able to use them full time in our primary care centers to devote their energy to help improving outcomes and improving access. Right now, for example, at Fenway, they're only part time. We can only put them part time on that work. The other work has to be spent in other places. So we would really like the opportunity to be able to close that gap, look at sustainability, because we believe that this one time funding, for example, would be really helpful. And again, just closing the gap. And then being able to use the value based payments we would generate, being able to use thank you so any much, paper Jean. service. Yes. Thank you so much. As an example, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm grateful to my colleagues for being here. Um, as we uh, move forward, um, you know, I, I could actually just leave this hearing open because we're going to continue to have conversations about it, but I will adjourn it because I think we can have a different scope of conversation for our next conversation, um, but my recommendation will, is that this will remain in committee. Um, so this hearing on docket 0473 is adjourned.